Today on The Culture War, we're going to be discussing education or indoctrination in schools. Are we going to, uh, is what's happening right now the appropriate degree of information being given to children, or is it inappropriate subject matter that parents should have more control of? This has been a big topic that's been happening for quite a bit. And actually, as of right now, as we're producing this show, gender studies is trending because there's news out of Florida where a university has removed the gender studies program. Now, a lot of people on the left would say it's not indoctrination, it's appropriate education. People on the right would call it indoctrination. But I think it's fair to point out that even on our shows, we've mentioned that whatever ideology you're bringing to your children is some form of uh, indoctrination. You, and you, you either want them to have your values or you don't want them to have someone else's values. So this is what we're going to be talking about today and probably a whole lot more. And we've got a couple of really great guests. Uh, would you like to start, Desmond? Hi, I'm Desmond Bambrini. So nice to meet everyone. I'm a learning specialist based in the Bay Area. Well, thanks for joining us. Of course. Hi, I'm Kelly Shinkeski. I'm a mom. I'm an education researcher at this point, and I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, uh, thank you both for, for, for joining. This should be very interesting. We, we were having a fairly decent conversation before, but we, just, we wanted to hold off. Hold off on it. On a lot of the questions, right. but uh, I think we could, we could, we'll start light. And you actually had a question for me about homeschooling. Yeah. And uh, you had mentioned, Kelly, homeschooling. So mm-hmm. let's, we'll, we'll start light right there. And uh, I don't know, did you want to ask? I got to say, so I I kind of, I like to do my background research and I'm like, oh, Tim Pool, there's a little bit of homeschooling here. I heard that word. And it may surprise people that I actually was homeschooled from sixth grade to eighth grade and definitely attribute, there was six other kids that were kind of in that homeschool program. And I think I attribute, I'd say most of my academic success because I was able to get that small, intensive kind of environment. Um, But it doesn't seem to work for absolutely everyone. And then on the other hand, it works for a lot of people. So I want to know your experience and your experience and what the benefits are and then also what the drawbacks are. And if you ever worry about things like socialization and things like that, I would love to get your perspective. Well, so let me let me start by asking both of you just one simple question. Where are you from? Bay Area, California. So I always say like, oh, you know, like the Golden Gate Bridge and how it goes into San Francisco. Ever wonder what's on the other side? Me. And that's where I'm from. (laughs) And Kelly, where are you from? I'm not far. The central coast of California. Oh, yeah. okay. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Because I was the first thing I was thinking, I was like, I wonder if region has something to do with perspectives on education, but yeah. you guys are actually fairly close. Fairly to each close other. to one another. Yeah. So uh, I have a rather strange and unique educational background. My mom started homeschooling me and my siblings the moment, like, I don't even know if it's fair to say from one, I think zero is probably to a certain degree, every parent is teaching their kids something, but yeah. my mom actually started having us do math and reading, and I was playing chess when I was like three. That doesn't mean a whole lot for a three-year-old, but it means they were showing me the chessboard, explaining the moves, and having me try and tell me what was right, what was wrong. By the time I started kindergarten, I already knew multiplication and division and a bunch of basic math stuff, negatives. Uh, always understood the concept of negatives and, you know, when it, you know very simple you know, grade school stuff, but for, for, you know, five-year-old entering kindergarten leaps and bounds above the kids around me. And, it, and they used to, we used to play this game in first grade called around the world. They, you, you get it from your desk, you stand behind the person next to you, and then the teacher pulls up a flashcard. And whoever says the answer first advances. If the person standing, it loses, they take that seat and that person stands up and if you make it all the way around the world, you get a ticket you get 10 tickets, you win a prize or whatever. Me and my brother, Never lost. Crushed. Love that. <laughs> ne- never, ne- just never lost. And eventually got to the point where they asked us to stop playing. Stop. So uh, I went to Catholic school from kindergarten until fifth grade, went to public school from sixth grade to eighth grade, spent, I think, three months in public high school. And that's where my grades went from very good to complete and total failure, straight Fs, except for music class, which didn't really have a grading curve anyway. Fair enough. And then that's when I stopped and did a correspondence school. And that was that was the end of it. So it's it's a mix of homeschooling and public schooling. And there's a big uh, uh, one, one of the big issues that everyone's talking about right now. And, and one thing we advocate for is more homeschooling and pod schooling, because I think the public schools are failing in a million different ways. Very interesting. So just a little bit about me is that actually so one thing that I do is actually somewhat of a pod program. So I, I, you know, went to Dartmouth, was a double major in gender studies and government, um, but went on to get my master's of science from Johns Hopkins and then moved on to start kind of my own education clinic. And one of our services is that we have like a pod. So as in we take students that have learning differences, learning disabilities, whatever you would want to call it. But it's a small pod, um, you know, two other learning specialists. And we kind of rotate those kids. There's like three or four of them. And you'd be amazed at like what these kids that were three or four years behind could be caught up fairly quickly if they're given the right environment and the right kind of focus on academic achievement. It's really insane what can be accomplished. 
Was yeah. your was your educational experience traditional or how would you describe it? I grew up in public school. I have a bachelor of arts degree in English. And for me, I was I was happy and content with the public school system. And it was personal experience that led us to homeschool, really. And uh, it was something, you know, my perspective of homeschooling was very narrow growing up. And from this experience, I've learned that homeschooling can actually be quite incredible. Yeah, It has brought uh, a lot of joy to our family and particularly an incredible love of learning, which has been great to see. I think I think pod learning is is probably the way to go. And I'll just give you my opinion right away. I despise the education system in this country. I'm not sure if that means anything like it's probably the same in most countries, but I it's 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 industrialized, it's mechanized, the bell ringing, it's it doesn't it doesn't help the average kid. I I, I grew up w- witnessing kids of tremendous talent be left behind, kids of uh, of who who needed that extra push not getting it. Mm-hmm. And I just said this one size fits all mechanization in schools is, 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 is a failure. Doesn't work. I only could stay there for two years because literally on the first day, right, they're talking about doing reading intervention. And I go, OK, so you got different levels. You got some kids that come in knowing addition, subtraction, multiplication. You got some kids that have never seen letters before. Yeah. And they go, OK, well, you, you know, you assess the kids. And I'm like, OK, that makes sense. You see who's the low group. Got it. You see who the high group is and you see the medium group. And I'm like, okay, that makes sense. And they go, okay, so the low group gets seen like, you know, five times a week. Medium group gets seen three times. High group gets seen twice. And I'm like, wait, that doesn't, but then the high group isn't going to get better. And they're like, but that, but they're like, but it's about making everyone the same. And I'm like, but that is extremely counterintuitive. This was the, Communism. The, the first day, <laughs> the first day of being a kindergarten teacher. And I have nothing to say poorly against my first school that I taught at. Love you very much, even though they don't even exist anymore. But there was something inherently wrong, which is why I couldn't stay in the public system. Because I'm like, I, I, you're telling me to do something that is designed to make everyone average. And I guarantee you, even the low kids, there's something not average about them, but you are literally giving me a reading instruction schedule that says by the end of the year, you want everyone at a level D. Some kids are wow. a level D already, and some kids aren't even a level double A, and you want everyone to be the same. That's yeah. That seems counterintuitive to me. When, when I was in grade school, I think it was eighth grade, they uh, did this new program where they uh, half the class was eighth grade, half the cl- class was seventh grade. The teacher taught the seventh graders and the eighth graders were left to their own devices. Interesting. And they said it was a good thing for oh, us. Oh, wow. And, you know, I got to admit, to a certain degree, fine, get the teachers yeah. off our back. They would right. say, here's your assignment. Have a nice day. Interesting. But, I mean, we're, we're 12 year, years mm-hmm. old. We may be smarter on average or whatever. We were like, you know, the 20 kids who were higher, you know, achieving. Right. But okay. that doesn't mean you don't give guidance yeah. to these kids as guidance. adults. So yeah, I find that I find that uh, really interesting. Uh, I my experience with public schools was nasty teachers who didn't care, tenured or whatever you call it. They couldn't be fired. They'd been there for decades. They were nasty. They were mean. The kids hated school, and it's it's a it's a damn shame that there is such a phrase. School sucks. Thank that you. kids are saying. They, right, there is an inherent issue with that. Right, there is an inherent issue with that idea of school being inherently thought of as bad as opposed to something that could be thought of as good, right? Now, the question, of course, remains, is that does homeschooling really fix the problem? Or is that simply like a Band-Aid on the situation, right? Because it's simply, or it's not even, Band-Aid would be the wrong word, right? It's simply not partaking in the system that yeah. we know to be broken, right? Because, you know, I was talking to different people, whether it be even on your team, right? And it's the idea of, oh, well, you know, my kid is like having trouble in like math and da 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 Kids are not cupcakes. They're not 24 done at the same time. They're not, <laughs> right? Like I always say that, right? Also, I like to make cupcakes. But it's like, but it's just simply pulling them out of the oven and kind of doing it, you know, easy bake oven status, doing it single one on one. Is that really like? Do you worry about socialization at all? I'm curious because we got to well, find something to disagree with because otherwise we can't just, we can't just <laughs> well, agree. We're just getting started. No, no. I got these books in. in front oh God, here we go. <laughs> the when I when I first started this journey, I was starting to see serious concerns with the public school system our children were in that I had grown up in, and after that, I was also seeing more homeschooling families flourishing Mm -hmm. and doing really, really well. Our kids were noticing that. And I was noticing these homeschool groups were getting to go on more field trips, be exposed to more experiences. And our kids were actually asking me to homeschool. And I was the resistant one in the family. Interesting. Because 
my perspective before was a very narrow perspective of what homeschooling was. Mm -hmm. And I've learned, you know, it's, there's, I think there's a great way to do homeschooling. And I think the perspective out there in society is one and it's narrow. And so for our experience, you know, we started homeschooling the fall of 2019, then COVID came. Mm -hmm. And so that impacted a lot of, you know, not just public school, but homeschoolers. We were socializing so much before that. And I think afterwards, um, we watched some people move out of state, a lot of people actually. And then we eventually what I did is I started a community group with a friend and we worked to build this group of kind of a non-co-op co-op so that we would have all those additional social experiences added in. So we've planned all kinds of field trips and activities and, and working on lectures um, with various leaders talking to the kids. And so anyways, I think like anything, it's an investment. It's what you make of it. And that goes for whether, you know, any type of education with our kids. Well, let's get into the meat and potatoes here. Right. With COVID, mm -hmm. you ended up seeing this Zoom schooling, which resulted in many circumstances where parents started hearing what teachers were telling their kids, which sparked a lot of controversy. Absolutely. In some circumstances, you actually had teachers saying, we can't let parents find out what we're telling their kids. Please don't tell me we said that. <laughs> well, I, I, but you don't have to say we, I mean. Like, well, as a teacher, I'd like to identify, but oh, I right, think right, right. we're right. better than that. But oh, there, gosh. There Probably were. There were a few circumstances, yeah. and this had a lot to do with critical race theory yep. and gender theory, gender ideology and gender theory. This was a component in what we saw happen in Loudoun County, which okay, I, I right. think you guys are familiar. That's, that's yes. actually just across just the street. We heard, yeah. Yeah, 20 seconds. You get in the car, you drive for 30 seconds, you're in Loudoun County. Right. Uh, you drive to the school, that's like 20 minutes. But this resulted in parents getting really, really angry. Now, the Loudoun County situation was actually an assault, which sparked a huge bit of controversy. Mm -hmm. The parents saying, what's going on in our schools? Mm -hmm. What are our kids being taught? And then you end up with these teachers showing up to these school board meetings saying, what is this book that is teaching kids to separate based on race or to, to uh, adopt these racial ideologies or, or gender based ideologies? And they got labeled terrorists mm. by the FBI. So this is what was a large catalyst for what we saw in Florida with the parental rights and education bill, as it was formerly named, and what we see now with the major push for pod learning and homeschooling, mm -hmm. that there is something going on in these schools that is presenting children with inappropriate material mm. or outright what uh, indoctrination into uh, uh, non-traditional ideologies. I'll, I'll be very light with it. Mm. Now, the position I've typically take, to, you know, a lot of people say no indoctrination in schools. And I say, no, 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 we want indoctrination in schools. We just want American indoctrination. We want okay. the Constitution. We want traditional uh, values. Not overtly, I'm saying more like the innocent until proven guilty, free mm. speech, these things. And now we have this clash of two different moral frameworks, two different worldviews, where you end up with books like, we have a couple books in front of us. This book is gay, as well as genderqueer. And uh, these end up, these find their ways into uh, middle schools. Recently, there was a teacher who was giving this book is gay to 10 and 12 year olds, which resulted in the police being called. So uh, I'll, I'll kick it off there. And uh, I don't know if one of you wants to start with your views on what's happening with the with bo these books being brought in these schools okay. and the ideologies being presented to children. I'll start out. So first of all, I have one question for you to maybe like address after, right? Which is the idea of, do you ever get worried about a lack of diversity for your students and like in a kind of pot, right? The idea of you have a pod, you're doing the field trips. That's amazing. You have a parent group. But if you get into Monterey or if you get into, for example, Marin County, I was the only black kid in my friggin' entire middle school, right? Mm -hmm. Do you get, uh, is there a kind of drawback to not having people that look, sound, and act different, right? And how do you weigh that, right? And then we got this book. I don't even know if I could grab it past the microphone. Let's see. Oh, there we go. <laughs> right? This one. Okay. I have read this book. I like this book. It was actually sent to me. I didn't buy it which is actually very interesting because here's this whole indoctrination, that idea of like, oh, you know, like LGBT, we're going to come for the kids and we're going to make them gay. I never bought this. A company, which I can't say which company, saw my TikToks and are like, we love what you're doing. We want to send you some books that your students would love. And they sent me this one. And I read this. My students, most of them cannot read this yet. <laughs> they cannot. Absolutely not. I think the book is great. I think it's absolutely spectacular that we get a queer perspective um, that we usually don't get, especially in kind of the mandated sex education, what do we call it, life skills now. But there is some graphic content in here 
that I I would I could not as a teacher give to a student. How how old are your students? Uh, real talk, actually, my students go from kindergarten all the way to twelfth because I have my master's in education, uh, special education focus, so I can actually teach kind of anywhere on that spectrum. Most of them kind of fall into late middle school or middle school. Um, and I, I, I can't give this. I'm not, and uh, side note, I'm not saying not any middle schooler could ever see this, but I'm saying it would be out of the scope of my educational job to hand this to a student without consulting parents and kind of taking into consideration individuality and where the student is. Now, do I think that a police officer needs to be called? Is the teacher committing malpractice? Not for me to decide. I'm not the judicial branch of government, right? I'm saying I wouldn't partake in it. But I would love to hear your thoughts and how maybe one of your students may never actually run into a book like this ever. And if you're okay with that. I would say, um, so just background, 2015 is when the California Healthy Youth Act was proposed in California. That was to, you know, basically bring in comprehensive sexuality education to the state would be required once in middle school, once in high school, with each district being able to add on grades K through 12 to their decision. Um, and so for me, I I started learning about this actually December 2018. Uh, this this oh, had wow. already been implemented. Books like this or? Well, comprehensive sexuality education itself has has a, a framework to this. But then in addition to that, there's supplemental curricula that they were using first to abide by in 2018, the California Healthy Youth Act law, which it became law in 2016. And, and the content does, in a way, relate to the literature just because of the fact that it brought in an update to the, the health framework in California. And so through the health framework, there was a v variety of books being introduced to align with CSE. And some of those books are are what I started looking into. And I'm, I'm going through and parents are sharing things on social media. And I had never seen some of these books. So looking through them, then I had to go for myself to the library to see these books for myself, read through the health framework. But one of the most, I would say, explicit books that I saw was called SEX, The All You Need to Know Guide to Get You Through Your Teens and Twenties by Heather Karina. And so I remember a parent posting about this and thinking, this can't be real. <laughs> because it was recommended originally in the health framework draft as a a school-wide read for grades 9 through 12. Now, the health framework, it's important. That is not required, but teachers can, you know, use that material to their discretion, usually with accordance to their curriculum director at school. So at any rate, that book started discussing topics like, uh, like blood play or... Um, uh, fisting or deeper manual sex and these various topics. And then it said, what is it? And then how do I do it? And there was a long description. Sometimes it referenced the slang terms of the sex act. And then at the very bottom, there was this small section that said the risks, but it was so small. And this is in grade school. This was or originally recommended as a school wide read for grades nine through 12 to high school. And they did take it out of the health framework. And as I was learning, I initially thought, okay, this is not going to be allowed in schools because they took it out of the health framework, but it, it has been used in some schools. And, and the thing for me was that book, I mean, there was stuff in there I hadn't heard of. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. Valid. Um, and I just feel like there, there's such a window of time of childhood um, where I mean, I just didn't, some of these these books and the graphic visuals, I just well, I, personally don't think it's necessary. My view on all this, I, I pulled it up, SEX, Second Education. It says on Amazon, reading age 12 years and up, grade level seven and up. And the fir first component to this is whether or not parents have the right to decide what their children are being exposed to and when. And there's been an, an interesting amount of pushback from traditional liberals and more left ideological individuals saying, mm -hmm. No, they're our children and we're the experts, so we decide. Mm -hmm. And w one of the uh, principal components of the parental rights and education bill in Florida was specifically that parents must be informed about what's going on with their kid, what their, what their children are learning. 
And then the uh, political debate turned into don't say gay, dis- despite the fact the bill bars people from talking about straight and heterosexual couples Which is as well. Fascinating. So sorry to interrupt, by the way, but it's fascinating, though. So let's like we might as well like really dive into it, though. Then why why is like LGBTQIA simply the target of like the accusations of indoctrination? That's what I want to know. Right. Because real talk, if you're like an OG queer, right. No one wants, we're not trying to make kids gay. We don't need more kids to be trans. Uh, One thing that I always try to do is I try to reframe, right? Like reframe means that idea of like looking at somebody else's perspective, right? So I look at the other side's perspective. Parent, worried, explicit sexual content. You may be wanting to alter my child's sexuality. You may be trying to make them kind of go through, uh, you know, uh, kind of hormone replacement therapy that may not be safe or not entirely proven. I- I'm worried about it. Therefore, I'm going to pull my kid. I see. I see that perspective. I don't necessarily agree with it, but I see it. I want to know what the opposing perspective is. Like, what would LGBTQIA, the trans community, gay individuals, what do we get out of getting kids I actually, to be gay or this material? Yeah. Like, I don't know. Like, I get the accusation. I get LGBTQIA. They're after they're indo- we're indoctrinating. You know, Desmond, you wear makeup in front of kids and you're going to try to like make them all wear makeup. Why? Like, why would that benefit me in any way, shape or form? Like, that's why I don't understand that accusation. So I, th- I and I would love to hear your perspective and your perspective yeah. on like what like I get it. I get it. I don't. I, Again, not saying it's a bad book, right? But I'm just as protective. That was an overreach. I am extremely protective of kids almost as much as the parents, right? Well, and I uh, I think to that, for for my part, it never was about LGBTQ. Okay. It, it was just about the explicit content. Um, content because, right. and I actually think that a lot of people, um, whatever their, you know, belief is, right. I think they do agree that, there's pornographic content. Kids shouldn't be exposed to shouldn't that. Be expo- well, we, and, but, but why is it? So so for me, yeah. not about LGBT at all. Right. However, mm-hmm. it's these books typically that are wading into overt graphic content. Right. They're being given to grade schoolers. Right. And these teachers are saying, don't tell the parents. Right. Mm-hmm. They're saying we should resist these bills that give parents access to knowledge about the curriculum. Right. And then when Ron DeSantis does a press conference where he shows sexually graphic content, they say he's banning books. That he's and, and, then, and then what they do is they put on these shows where they'll have Catcher in the Rye and act like that's what's being banned. And no, uh, the, the issue I see with, for instance, this book is gay. That is not sex education. Gender queer is not, not sex education. This is kink education. Children, I, th- I think it's, it's fair to say to a parent, Hey, your kids are entering this age and we'd like to discuss the birds and the bees, general reproduction and, you know, how this stuff happens. When I was in fifth grade at a Catholic school, they gave us permission forms. We went to our parents. Our parents said yes or no. Right. Some kids were pulled out. Most of us, there was a, there was male sex ed. Mm-hmm. Then the boys would go to the computer room. The girls would come in and do female sex ed. And the funny thing with that was the boys got like two hours of game time and the girls got like 20 minutes. Right. But what we're seeing with these books is this book is gay, describes scat. It teaches how to use grinder right. and this is being provided to middle schoolers. Right. And then right. what happens is when this, when this teacher comes out mm-hmm. and she gives it to our middle schoolers, the parents call the police right. because you cannot, it's, it's illegal you to give children. Pornographic. Yeah, absolutely. That's not well, protected wh- under free speech. We have the Supreme court case. To kind what of happens it. then is NBC news shows a picture of her holding a different book, huh. which is about more ideological issues. And then says that she was trying to support gay rights when the reality was parents were concerned that she was teaching 10 year olds how to use grinder. Right. There's no reason for that. But well, and I. Oh, sorry. No, please go. Oh, OK. Um, I think personally that I mean, with this, we've sh- we've seen a shift from sex ed to comprehensive sexuality education. So for me, it took me time to understand well, what is CSE, Comprehensive Sexuality Education? Where did it come from? What's the belief system behind it? What's driving these ideas? And for me, being able to see where it was implemented in other countries prior to the U.S., being able to look into the original framework um, was helpful to understand where it's coming from because, for example, uh, in, in the document, it references sexual citizenship, which was new to me, and and pleasure was a focus. And the goal is to teach this to grades K through 12. Even some of the groups aligned for the National Sexuality Education Standards um, did a presentation where they were talking about this, this concept of 
you know, sexuality education, and they really want to reach kids in the early elementary grades. Um, and so I think it's it's an important analysis that we pause. And for me, it was, how do I learn everything I can about this, which I'm still continuing to research and figure it out. But those frameworks, um, particularly whether it's from, you know, Planned Parenthood or the World Health Organization with their definitions of terms, um, the idea that it has gone from more of a biological safety prevention it's different from what I had in okay. California. And then into um, a completely separate thing. For me, schools don't exist to teach sexual technique. And yeah, that's- I, I, I agree. And glory hole in, in this book, in, in its glossary of terms, it refers to Grindr as a social network app for gay and bi men. And so, you know, the interesting thing is there seems to be, uh, dildo, a tribal left or right division where you end up with people seeing this book and saying, yo, that should not be given to 10 year olds and 12 year olds. The parents called the police on this woman. Absolutely. Then we have a guest come on this show, a prominent left personality who says the book is good and should not be banned. I say, it's I I believe the only reason they're saying it is because they want to appear to be on the left publicly. Which is tricky, right? Because then you also have the other side of the situation, right? Where that idea of if I ask like pronouns or it's like, oh, like what are your pronouns? You're then automatically associated with supporting, like like giving this to a a seven-year-old, which is not necessarily the case, right? right? So it's that idea of, like you said, there's tribalism. But that to me is an issue. And I feel like there's also this kind of false comparison that's happening because we see an uptick of LGBTQIA awareness. And we also see an uptick of literature like this, right? So it's like, oh gosh, are we equating the two when really it's just, we need to kind of redraw the boundaries on what is kind of permitted for teachers to teach, what is not permitted, what our job is, where it falls outside of the bounds because I see it and I understand the concern, right? I mean, like, don't get it twisted. Like I, I watched the show. I saw like there was like the graph and oh, like, like left-handedness and, da, 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 and like right. that. It was a really interesting point, right? Now with that said, is it entirely, would I make in, entirely the same argument? Probably not, right? Because it's trending a little bit. Yeah, I said it, right? Well, but people but, people pointed out that uh, the left-handedness argument yeah. omits the previous centuries. Right. Where left-handedness is very high, there's a dip and then a recovery. Right. So if you just take one metric that shows it going up, it you can change the Well, the I'll give context. you like a completely different argument, which you may have not heard, which actually gets everyone to hate me. And being someone who's somewhat, I, and people call me centralist, and I don't know if that's actually a thing. That if, if I am, I just try to think of each thing individually. But here's kind of how I see it is that there is kind of an inherent LGBTQIA population. That population will never go away, no matter what, in my opinion. Um, And yeah, I do think that kind of you look at the research, the gender studies research, that scientifically we could delineate things like, yeah, there may be a a little bit more of a bisexual population than people care to admit. Possibly. Possibly. Right? Kinsey scale. People may be a little bit more bi than we think. Now people are coming out. And then more people are coming out because they're more comfortable. And then it trended a little bit. And yeah, it trended a little bit. Now, for hundreds, if not thousands of years, straight was trending and people were lying about being straight for a very long time. Is it that bad that in the past two decades, a couple people may not be lying, but experimenting with different titles, different sexualities, even before they understand it? I'm kind of like playing the how big is your problem game with my kids. I don't know if it's a huge issue that some kid is like, oh, I'm you know, genderqueer at the age of like 11. It's like, do you even know what that means? And if you do, great. And if not, okay. But you're not hurting anyone. You're not hurting yourself. Like, what would you, what do you think? I would, I would, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. go ahead. I was going to say they are hurting themselves. Tell, yeah, tell me. So one of the bigger issues with uh, uh, pronouns and stuff and all yeah. these things is, for one, there's no logical consistency to teach. You end up with these viral videos of a, a, this young woman on TikTok with, you know, hundreds of thousands of views saying frog and frog self. And it seems to just be- this already. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 the people on the left will argue that well it's people exploring their self expression and it's just like well there's there's no logic there's a flag for everything you're all you're basically telling kids is nothing you're right. you're, you're telling them chaos static noise no definitive understanding of what's going on perhaps an adult could understand enough about reality to explore various ideas around how do you categorize but to go to a child and say an infinite number of categories. Every day they're learning something that was just made up yesterday. They're going to have no framework for what's going on. Well, sorry, just to address the the harming themselves. 
with the laws being passed in California, Washington, and a bunch of these other states that protect third parties who would bring a child for gender reassignment or, or, or med medical intervention, we're now entering the territory where a 10 year old kid who has no understanding of what's going on is told by an adult, and this has happened to personal friends of mine twice, and, and that seems like a heck of a lot for, for me. Two, two people that I know had their daughters come home with the teachers telling them that they were trans or lesbian, and they were not. They were 10. And when the parents explained to them, okay, let me ask you, you're, you think you're this, do you know what this means? And the kids go, what? No, no, no. Now, what happens if you're in California and the parents are more susceptible to whatever you say, honey? Next thing you know, these kids who have no idea what Lupron is or what it means to get uh, 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 puberty blockers is on a fast track for this, which has resulted in 50,000 people on Reddit joining the D-trans community and a, an endless slew of posts of people threatening suicide. What, we, what I see in the data, and uh, so if you look at the desistance rates, what is it? The, the number I believe is like 68 to 95 percent of children who identify as transgender will desist. That doesn't mean detransition. It means that if left to go through their natural puberty, they end up uh, 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 identifying with their biological sex. Typically, they end up being either autistic or gay. What happens now is they will just affirm whatever it is the kid is saying, despite the fact the majority of these kids would self-identify uh, if they're allowed to go through puberty. My concern here is you bring in young kids who don't understand what they're hearing. You layer on books and ideas and things that are more confusing to a child than anything. You layer on the, the social factor of Instagram likes, views, etc., and you end up with all of these stories of these prominent, now famous detransitioners saying, I didn't understand. More horrifyingly, you end up with these stories on Dtrans Reddit, where we read one last night where a, a 17 year old was threatening suicide because she felt manipulated into getting a double mastectomy, testosterone, and it ruined her life. And now she feels like she she can't lead a normal life. Well, yeah. you, you have these laws being passed that would protect a third party. A third party can take someone's child to the state, dramatically alter their life cause irreversible changes and or harm and be legally protected because these kids are not equipped to understand what they're what, what they're signing up for. My last point on this is if desistance rates truly are between 60 and 95 percent and suicide rates are around 40 to 50 percent, the smartest and most logical thing we can do, considering uh, the majority of these kids will uh, identi identify with their biological sex, not be trans and thus experience lower rates of suicide is not to intervene at all in any medical way for a child who's experiencing gender dysphoria until after puberty. If the if if we're looking at it from a simple prob probabilistic standpoint, you got to let's just say it's the lowest number, 60 okay. percent. You have a greater than chance probability your child will just self-identify with their biological sex and thus not experience a 50 50 suicide rate. It seems like the math is fairly obvious. You transition your kid, you are boosting their suicide rate to 47%. Well, and I was going to say, I mean, for my part, I mean, I have two friends who they had CPS called on them. If if you didn't seem like you were immediately uh, affirming. celebrating, affirming, um, yeah, CPS was called on them. And then this is what I'm noticing uh, just overall is that the the California legislature and other places, in my opinion, are chipping away at parental responsibilities, traditional parental responsibilities. And this this area is one. But I mean, in the midst of this, we do have a growing number, little by little here, of young people who are detransitioning. But the mm -hmm. thing I ha I I'm concerned about is that there is this messaging of celebrate, celebrate, celebrate towards those who are making these decisions. But the detransitioners are often humiliated, silenced, and shamed. And to me, that is indicative of, of part, and I, I don't think everybody believes that. I think there's a lot of people that, that don't, but I think the way in which I have seen detransitioners uh, treated, it, it's, it's, it's so sad. See, I don't I don't actually see I don't actually agree with this. However, I do 100% understand where you're coming from. And I see that logic and I understand your mathematical model and that statistically. 
I understand your point of view. And I get that. However, I'm going to make a comparison. And again, because I, I just love getting people to hate me. That's just like my job, right? It's like, do you remember um, kind of like, po- like pre-2020 where like the classic news was black individuals are targeted by the police and it never makes it on the news. And that was the news story. Like the news story itself was black people are never on the news. That to me is the same situation where it's like the, the current news story is detransitioners are never on the news, which inherently puts them on the news, right? Like, you know what I mean? Like, I understand your perspective, but I've heard it so many times by the same groups of people. Like, well, we never pay attention to detransitioners because that amount is like infinitesimally small. And actually, we do hear about it all the freaking time. You just are. Oh, it's always in the context of, oh, we never hear about detransitioners. Yes, we do. It's literally on. Like, it's like on right. every YouTube channel. on am right. I hear it consistently. And then like that other side note, though, of that idea of like, well, it's always to, like celebrate, celebrate, celebrate. Just an idea. Just an, just an idea. That idea. Of, yes, parents, you guys, you know, you know your kids and you know them extremely well. Right. However, however, if you don't celebrate a kid's exploration into different topics, they sometimes start pushing back without even knowing what they're pushing back against. And that's actually what I'm more worried about. That idea of, and of course I can't speak on like specific clients, right? But like I can say I've had multiple instances where a parent has, you know, come to me and being like, oh, well, you know, she wants to be called he now. What do I do? And I got to say, I say the exact opposite thing of kind of what you're going for is I say like, go with it. Because when you start pushing against it, they start pushing back on the parent without even knowing what they're pushing back on. And I've had plenty of students, plenty of students, and this is nothing, nothing against the trans community because I'm such like, obviously, right? But I've had plenty of students who, yeah, they are genderqueer and whatever, and their pronouns say whatever. And I've also had plenty of students where they said, oh yeah, I'm definitely trans. And we were like, oh, cool. Okay. They, them, he, him, she, her, whatever. And you went with it for a couple months and then they realized after just leaving it with just going with it they're like actually that wasn't that's not a thing this is why parents don't want it in schools but but like okay okay but again like how big is the problem it's just i i don't see it as a fundamental issue right i see of course any teacher going outside of their realm of expertise as an issue right i am a learning specialist with a master of science in education with a focus in language processing disorders i'm not an endocrinologist i can't say you should take this hormone that's out of my that's out of my scope i can't say that that's not allowed or it shouldn't be right but also that uh, that idea of like is it really that bad if like oh okay you go by she they and then i call my student they and everyone on tiktok i can't believe you call students they them you're indoctrinating no like they literally asked me to call them they them like it's just i don't know if this indoctrination thing is real i do understand the statistical analysis that you gave though i'd well, love to hear more about that i'd say it is okay with books like gender queer and this book is gay being in, in schools and there's a, a substantially it's more than just these two books we have in front of us and then of course critical race theory was the big debate a couple of years ago because it seems like critical theory in general was being brought into schools in, in a variety of ways. So it is indoctrination. Okay. Uh, my response to most people is like, we want indoctrination. We just don't want that indoctrination. We want to teach the, the positive values of our moral frameworks, innocent until proven guilty, et cetera. Those are, those are big components of the rights of the individual, meritocracy. And now we have children being taught an inversion of this. And we have, in many circumstances, the severing of the... Uh, 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 the family unit in terms of don't tell your parents. Okay. The response from liberals is they're, they're trying to force schools to out the children to their parents. Well, Which it's is- not your, you have no right. If, 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 a, if a child is experiencing anything, be it bulimia mm-hmm. or uh, uh, some kind of gender confusion, mm-hmm. it is not the state's obligation nor right to, to uh, uh, intervene in that regard. But that is what's happening. Well, and I want to say something to that because um, f- for for a couple things with regards to schools, I mean, um, we had a situation where uh, a volunteer at a school had threatened our oldest when he was young. And I I noticed some change in him after school. And it was I was never told about this. So I, I actually approached the school staff. And then that's when I learned of the situation. Um, There was another situation with our youngest in school where there were threats from other students. And so I actually, one of the times I went to the school board meeting is our, our, our youngest had had multiple threats um, from a student, really descriptive graphic threats. And what happened was 
I, I, I had been getting those notices about, you know, your child's been exposed to lice, your child's been exposed to strep throat. But I was never notified when our, our littlest had these very scary experiences at school. Liability it, issues. Yeah, it's it's very concerning. But and so, nonetheless, a false, uh, but a false equivalent. Like they're not, they're not the same thing, right? Like that idea of like this is what I'm like constantly trying to get on, which is that idea of like they're not the same thing. Like your child being threatened, you need to tell the parent. Your child is injured, you need to fill out an accident report. That actually is usually mandated, but it's like different if it's like oh, so and so said they want to go by they them. Would I tell the parent a thousand percent, right? But is it like, uh, like, is it mandated? Like, is it, uh, hear me out. He okay, and this is like very tricky. If a student ever comes to me and they're like, I go by they, them, but my mom doesn't know, or my dad doesn't know. My first thought is there's something that needs to be repaired within family communication. It's not, I gotta hide this kid's gender identity from the parent. It's the idea of we need to create some type of environment where this conversation needs to happen. Because if I immediately, and I'm not saying this is even the case, right? But if a teacher immediately, like you said, like outs a kid, right? That could create a problematic situation. In fact, it could be creating a situation where it's indoctrination to be straight and cisgendered, right? Which is actually much more indoctrinating. It's usually that way, right? Like on average, most Disney movies, despite like new recent developments, most Disney movies kind of perpetuate that kind of what we consider the the fancy word is like heteronormative, right? Heteronormative cisgendered ideologies. And, and do we need to kind of perpetuate that as the norm? I love that idea of like, you know, we want to indoctrinate innocent until proven guilty, but does that translate to straight until proven gay? Like those are two very different things in my opinion. Well, don't do any of it. Yeah, and I so, think, yeah, uh, sorry. No, I was ahead. gonna say, I think for my part, it is a fair comparison, only in the sense of parents are being notified less and less of all kinds of things. Okay, fair. And, and I think too, I just wanted to, to, to the point earlier, with regards to um, you know the, the stories in the news, it's not so much the news stories, it's the organizations that promote certain things, I don't see any of those organizations supporting detransitioners. And I think that to me starts to make me question what's going on? What, why, why is it they, they only celebrate, but those who experience regret feel like they're oftentimes alone. And I feel like everyone should be able to get behind those people because I think they, they need love and support. I have you know? no well, issue. And no, I, I, I think we agree on <laughs> yeah. that. I, well, yeah, go ahead. So I, I can give us, we have an example here from the Daily Mail. This is from February. New York teacher manipulated fifth grade student into changing gender without parents' consent, which drove her to consider suicide lawsuit claims. The response you typically get from uh, people on the left is, it's an anecdote. It's one story. To That's, which my, my yeah. response is, then why not just when Ben Shapiro comes out and says this is bad, you go, you are so right, Ben Shapiro. I'm so sorry this happened. Instead, the response you get is dismissal, saying, no, you're wrong. No, this doesn't matter, which then you, you basically have overt support from the political left in this country of things like this when they dismiss or defend it. Okay, okay, it's two questions, and I'm not even saying that I'm right on this. I want to know if the teacher was gay. <laughs> no. Like, they weren't. The t New York teacher that supported wasn't gay, right? The teacher was, according to the lawsuit and yes. photographs. They're not gay, I bet. Reading LGBT bo books to children and encouraging them to try being gay even if they were not. Okay, yeah. is the teacher gay? I don't believe the teacher is gay. I don't think so either, because no one actually gay would ever say that. Like no well, one. Well, to be fair, I, we don't know. We don't actually, and that was a complete kind of. She does have blue hair. That, that I know, right? And I'm so <laughs> sick of like, oh my god, if you have colored hair, you're gay. It's like I'm so sick of that, right? Um, but like that idea of like, I don't think actually LGBTQ is trying to indoctrinate anyone. I know that word gets tossed around, but like, we're not coming for your kids. Tr like, drag queens aren't coming for your kids. Drag queens aren't e trying to make your kids trans. Drag queens and trans people aren't even in the same freaking category. One's a performance and the other is a gender identity. Well, like, that, and, and actually, no, no, right? But here, oh, sorry. You are correct, but yeah, now but like, you're seeing the, the, the blur and the blend where we actually had a debate between two drag queens and one of the drag queens says that they are trans. Which is so, interesting to me there's no but rules like, there's no rules right but there's hear no me out there are there is some logic that we can stick to right there's some logic that we could stick to logic that i've been canceled for before and i will be canceled again right uh blue blue self alligator alligator self i will call you whatever the hell you want i don't care right pronouns replace what if a white kid says they want to be called black okay great question fan 
fantastic question. I will address the first point and then I will get to that point. And I love that question. That, that idea of I will call you whatever the heck you want, but a pronoun replaces a noun, right? Cat, cat self is not a pronoun. It doesn't replace a noun. It is a noun, right? So that's not a pronoun. Your pronouns are not cat, cat self. You may want to be called cat, cat self. And that's fine with me. I'll call you whatever the heck you want, but that's not a pronoun. So that's where I draw the line as an educator, right? Pronouns are he, him, they, them, it, it's like all of that stuff, right? And those should be valued, but I don't think we should also be like, well, I'm not going to call you cat. It's like, oh, what if they want to be called cat? Now to that idea of like, Race. What if, race, right? Such a good question. I would love to hear your thoughts on this, right? Now, here is where I differentiate the two. Being a gender studies major, right, which people have different ideas of, one of my biggest fascinations, both having my master's of science and bachelor's in gender studies, is where is the line between a biological difference and a social difference between men and women on a biological level? right? Where is, where's the line, right? Where do we go? Boys will be boys. And where do we go? Oh, that actually is just societally okay. And it, it has nothing to do with biology. So here's the thing. There are biological differences between men and women, right? I was featured in like, what is a woman? And I was like, and I was like called out in that movie. And I never even got cut up for it. But like someone could ask me like, what is a woman? It depends on the context you're asking me. Are you asking me in a scientific context? XX chromosome. Are you asking me in a social context? Self-identifying, like saying, um, oh, what is an athlete? Self-identifying. But here's where it gets tricky. We know that there are biological differences between men and women. For example, women, oxytocin, better at communicating, better kind of at empathy. We have the, we have the chemicals to prove it. I have always identified with that ability, right? With that ability. I think it comes naturally to me. Hence the title non-binary, right? I identify with a biological trait that is usually kind of seen in women. Therefore, I call myself non-binary to help some people make that connection. Now, if you say, well, a white kid wants to be called black, what exactly are you identifying with that is black? Because by definition, if you think that black people act a certain way or do things in a certain way, that's racism. There's nothing different between white and black other than skin tone. There are biological differences between men and women. There are not biological differences between white and black other than melanin, right? That's why if a white kid said, I want to be black, I'd be like, what's your black experience that you're experiencing? If you, well, yes, tell. Well, I'll push back a little bit. Okay, there, I want to hear this. There are obvious bio biological differences between white and black beyond just melanin okay we've got some muscle but, differences height differences i got you that's fair well yeah and, and i don't i don't think the color of the skin or the race it matters that much but obviously sickle cell affects the black population more so absolutely but then the, the issue uh, we've talked about this quite a bit one of the arguments being made by uh, gender ideologues is that we used to have racial segregation in this country mm -hmm. and what was the argument for having black bathrooms and white bathrooms there was a bit of a just moralistic, non-scientific view of mm -hmm. what was supposed to be. Right. But then there were also arguments presented by people who were trying to justify why we had racial segregation, saying things like the danger, you know, of black people are different in this way and that there's risks. But the reality is you get a black man from Somalia and a black man from Haiti, and they're very, very, very different. Very different. And then the only discernible characteristic is the color of their skin, which doesn't seem to actually help identify anything. Thank you. Exactly, right? Like my black experience being kind of 51% Italian, but still identifying as black is very different than somebody else's black experience. So yeah. a thousand percent. I have nothing to push back against when it comes but to that. Because gender, yes. gender segregation, Yeah. everywhere you go in the world, you yeah. find almost the exact same biological differences between men and women. Okay, right. And that, it, which is why, which is why in, inherently, if you find biological differences between men and women, but on the circumstances where you have somebody that is assigned male at birth that identifies more with female traits or a female assigned at birth individual that kind of identifies more with male traits, we have a biological category, not utter chaos, that we can kind of make a distinction from. Oh, you are biologically this, but tend to have these characteristics, therefore trans, therefore non-binary. We don't have that with the black population. But, but if, if when it comes to gender stuff, why why then surgery? If if gender is social, why do you need to medically or surgically affirm it? Do you want to take that one? Because that is such a good question. <laughs> Well, I, yeah, and I was gonna, I was gonna ask actually, with regards to like sports and stuff, if if there's this known biological difference, which I believe there is, mm -hmm. you know, having having <clears throat> sports competitions be changed, or you know, the prison system and all of these right. different things. Well, that's like, but again, oh gosh, where do I even want to go with that? But like that idea of like the trans athlete in sport, I gotta say, like I'm so like sick of that one, right? Because it's like such a niche issue that like no one should really care about, and yet everyone cares about People's it so much. People's careers are being damaged. I, like. That's valid. That's yeah. valid. But it's such like a specific. <laughs> it's so specific to the point where it's like, oh, it's so constantly being blown out of proportion. When I feel like there are larger issues, but that idea of like why surgery, 
right? And it's very interesting to kind of look at the different kind of LGBTQIA perspectives, that idea of to be trans, you don't need affirming surgery, but that I same idea of it should be accessible and it should be. But what are the processes that we need to go through to make sure gender affirming care is beneficial? What guardrails do we need to put in play? I don't think banning it outright is a good situation. I don't think declaring, oh, and again, this kind of goes into uh, kind of reverse of your opinion, that idea of like, wait for them to go through puberty entirely. That could be really, really kind of mentally draining for um, somebody who's trans, right? That needs there's, to go through a puberty. Yeah, tell there's me. There's no argument against I, I do not believe yeah. that there is any any logical argument against what i said if if desistance rates are studied right. studied found to be between 60 and 95 yeah. percent then all you are doing by transitioning a minor is right. risking their suicide okay so hear me out desistance rates first of all those studies are have you seen those dis, have you seen those studies they're we, a we, mess like those those are like the smallest sample sizes with the most isolated geographic locations that i have ever seen in study like those are ridiculously biased I'm not saying you're wrong because I can't, I can't prove otherwise, right? I, but I, I, my only response is, yeah. the left and the right both point to each other's studies and so say they're saying wrong. they're wrong. Absolutely, and a thousand percent, I could say like the left and the right. And I don't even, I know it sounds crazy because like the way I look and the way I talk, but like I don't even say if I'm on the left or right technically because I'm a teacher and I don't think I should bring a political opinion to the classroom. And since I'm a media figure, I don't think I should disseminate that information. But with that said, right, like that idea of like, okay, well, it's tricky. Okay, personal example, but, but, but yeah. If, if, if the only data we have shows desistance rates to be this high, okay. there is no medical or scientific argument for transitioning minors. Okay, hear me out. Hear me out. Okay, here's here's a question, and I'll ask both of you this, right? Because as you know, right outside of San Francisco, very uh, progressive family, despite, of course, having the social <clears throat> pressures of society. I did not start dance until the fourth grade because I thought dancing was for girls. And I didn't want to do something that was for girls. I did every single sport. I tried to be a boy so hard, right? And I, and, you know, I had two moms and I got my nails painted and I went to preschool and oh, you're not allowed to wear pink nails. And I got them taken off, right? I, I can't wear nail polish anymore, mom. But here's the deal. I did have progressive parents. I did start growing facial hair when I was like 12, right? And that did not work for me. It did not work. I don't identify as trans. I identify as non-binary. Facial hair, you look great, by the way. Facial hair did not work for me. It did not work to the point where I could not shave. Like, and I know that sounds weird, but that idea of not only was facial hair wrong, but needing to deal with facial hair was inherently problematic. My mom had to shave for me. Yes, I just said that on the live podcast. You said you had two moms? I do. They were separated, right? And that's actually, and yeah, really good question that we can go into there because then a lot of people are like, well, they indoctrinated you. No, they didn't. Um, but like, here's the deal. That idea of, hear me out. One actually had to shave for me because I was so against, I was so against shaving. And did I get laser hair removal on my face at the age of like 15, 16? A thousand percent. And did that make high school and college a lot easier for me? A thousand percent. And that's a medical intervention that I did at a very young age, but it worked for me. And I actually, and in a way, it supports both of our arguments. Well, right? I don't think removing yeah. removing hair is comparable to sterilization. It, well, absolutely, right? Um, but in a way, it's p part of it is, but at the same time, not to the extremity. And I will respect that actual analysis that you just gave, right? But that idea of like, but it's crazy, right? It's crazy to me, like to kind of go back off that, like, oh, well, you had two moms, right? That idea of like, oh, people think that I was somehow indoctrinated by LGBTQ, that I was indoctrinated by you know, my mom's, but I was indoctrinated by the Bay Area. It's not the case. If anything, if you talk to any queer or trans person other than the people that desist, you got to remember those people. But a, the, a majority of us, we fought against feeling this way and acting this way for a very long time. Like we didn't just go like, oh, you know, it'd be kind of fun to wear pink eyeshadow every day. That seems like a good idea. But that, that, yeah. that's, a, that's a social choice. That is a social make. choice, yeah. I mean, you don't but have to a, wear makeup. Right, but right, but it's a social choice that I had the right to make, right? Yeah. And and do we take that right away from kids? If if your son comes to you one day after you know getting one of these books, being like, oh, mom, I want to try out eyeshadow. I think it'd be kind of interesting to experiment with that. My guess is you'd get, would, would there be a little bit of pushback from you there? And if so, why? I think, I mean, I, I think, I mean, for me, could this, he wear the eyeshadow? No, I'm <laughs> no, no. Um, I, I really think 
with regards to these topics, with regards to all of this, um, we have a we have a situation where I do think there's um, a variety of cl- conflicting worldviews, mm-hmm. but I don't think that comparing. I mean, for my part, I don't think there's any comparison of uh, you know facial hair removal to. I mean, I had only learned really probably a, maybe not even a year ago mm-hmm. that the medications that are referred to as puberty <clears throat> blockers are oftentimes prostate cancer drugs. I didn't know that. Or used to chemically castrate sex offenders. Right. I didn't know that. And not only that, but the surgeries. So the surgeries like a, like a double mastectomy or some of these ver- various surgeries have serious, serious consequences. Um, and, I, and I think that, you know, obviously the drugs do as well. These are things that are, are highly, highly concerning in regards to all of the side effects. And, you know, I I think medicine, um, it really makes me wonder why. Why would they be doing it? But also, you know, just the overall health factor. You know, there was a whole movement that probably still exists where, where people were saying that people shouldn't have the right to um, have their child, uh, their male child circumcised. And, and that was because, again, it was a medical intervention. And and now today we're in this other place where, you know, a double mastectomy could be given to a 15-year-old or a young child. How often does that happen, though, right? And then to conflate, right, and again, nothing against, because I actually am adoring this conversation, but to conflate the idea of, like, there being this like assault on parental rights with that like couple mastectomies that have happened, right? Like it just doesn't, let's take a look. Like I would love to see, cause I just, I think we're, we're thinking there's like an assault on children that just isn't real, right? Like, let's see, top surgeries. We got that, that's two, these are 250 per day. These, that's <clears throat> it. I mean, come on. That's like, we're not even at a thousand. That's but, not a lot of people. But you, under, you understand yeah. the issue is when right. some, someone like, sees you know, one photo of a teenage girl getting a yeah. double mastectomy right. and we say, hey, maybe we shouldn't do that. Yeah. The immediate response on the left is, oh, it doesn't matter at all. Okay, well, well okay, so I, do you want me to go? I, I want to say something yeah. to that because I think there's often this, and, and this was mentioned right. with the sports, it's just so small. It's just so small. But often it is those things that are small that are just simply a beginning. And I also think that for those however many people yeah. for for those people i i can't just look at that and go that's just small i i i value each and every one of them and i i think it's worth noting and looking at this is why you know when somebody detransitions i think those people need to be supported i want another percentage of those 282 people that regret it i want i will come we will be back in 10 years to look at that (laughs) same 282 people from 2022 or 20 yeah 21 and see what percent kind of right now hormone therapy that's a whole other story because there's a lot of medical interventions there but with the like double mastectomy idea like thousands right I'll go out and say it, which of course gets a whole bunch of people like totally pissed at me. Should you wait for a double mastectomy until you're an adult, in my opinion? Yeah, you should. Yeah, I said it and I'm gay. Oh my God. Right. But right. There are circumstances where it seems to have a positive outlook. I don't think hormone blockers are as terrible as people make it out to be. I think that we need to leave it to the endocrinologist. I just, I don't think we should be kind of swerving our lane. I have the doctors di- have come out and said that it is a positive intervention. I wouldn't be supporting it if doctors have not been like consistently, we have seen positive results. I just want well, to get a little uh, communist here and say, I don't trust the massive multinational corporate medicine industry in the United States at all. That's fair. So doctors who come out and say, yes, the insurance companies are paying us insert treatment. I'm like, I don't trust these people. Okay. Well, so. and I I, ha- I want to say too, I mean, there's there's been real issues in the US of medical malpractice. Every job field has corruption. Every job field has compromise. And I think too, it can be easy for people, you know, um, we're not getting into to different politics, but it can be easy for people to follow either what they're told to do right. or what their money coming in is telling that them they have to do. But medical malpractice, practice against minority populations that are at risk for being discriminated against, not in favor of, right? That idea of if you look at the medical malpractices that have been perpetuated by big pharma and multiple situations, they're always against minority populations. It's always against the black communities or the queer communities. Which is what we're arguing. No, for this one, we're arguing these people. For, okay, so, and which is so, and that is, I think, the thing that we're missing that, like, I think is, like, the most nuanced thing about this conversation is in the end, even though there's, like, opposing views, we actually 
everyone in this room cares about those 4,231 people, right? We just care about them in different ways. And we think that um, we think that we know what's best for them. And that's tricky, right? Because who really knows best for those 282 double mastectomy kind of individuals? Who really knows best for those 4,200? Can't see that last number. Well, look, One. They're, they're a child suffering from anorexia. We don't affirm. Right, Why? right. Okay, because it's actually damaging in the long Mastectomies run. Mastectomies are damaging. And in the like long you run. said, and then I could see how you kind of trace that, right? Because you go, we intervene because of anorexia, <clears throat> and then we trace that. You intervene because being trans leads to a higher suicide rate, so we need to intervene to stop it from happening. But in my opinion, you don't stop a trans individual from being trans. They're just trans. Like you can't just stop someone from being trans. They're going to be trans no matter well, what. Well, does it, the stu- all I can say is, when you look up the studies that we have, right, dissidence rates are uh, greater than the majority. Okay, and no, so there's, yeah. I just, you, you can make the argument that you don't trust the studies, and right. absolutely, that's fine. There's right. a lot of studies people don't. Well, trust. no, because that's somewhat of a shallow argument, being like, well, your studies aren't right, but no, but, your but how, are then, valid. then how is there any response to if we went with the higher number of ninety five percent, you right. are effectively condemning children to high rates of suicide by affirming something they don't understand if they have a ninety plus percent chance of just identifying with their biological sex. By by age fourteen or fifteen. Well, I don't, again, I'm chatty, so I want to know your opinion. But then I, what I would and, and, and I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll add to it too. If the response is, oh, it's only a few thousand people who are going to hormone therapy. Literally, a it's only a thousand. couple hundred girls per year who are getting double mastectomies. You also have these D trans stories. Fifty thousand right. members on the D trans Reddit, and the posts are are, are saddening and horrifying. Right. The post we read last night was from a seventeen year old who said that where her mother didn't protect her. So, so okay, question. 17-year-old trans guy or D-trans? female who got a double mastectomy and So two. but uh, sorry. So trans was a trans guy identifies so, as female. Identifies now. as female now. Right. Okay, so hear me out and this is a question that like I actually want to pose to you guys, right? And like really consider it. I feel like your concerns are valid and I think that they come from good places and I think that basically what I've read about this and also what I've kind of heard about you I feel like there's like a a misconception we care we care in this room do you think we're making a certain person or group of people in this situation the bad guy right because it's always framed in my opinion it's always framed in the same way just like how it was always it's the black people that are going to come after the white people so we need to separate the bathrooms and I hear the same they're coming after the girls Right. That's all, always right. And always these trans conversations. It's always that idea of they're com- they're going to try to take the girls and make them guys and they're going to regret it. They're, the guys are going to try to go into the women's bathroom. And it always turns like the girls into this like kind of like this this kind of victim, right? Like this victim mentality, like not mentality, but this victim mindset of like we need to protect the women and the girls from the gays because they're trying to go after them. And it's so ludicrous in well, my I don't, I don't think that's true. I think, no, it's, no, I don't think it's true for you at all, but I think the no, general I, population I, is, I, I don't see that in any of the arguments. The you arguments, don't see that? Okay. No, it's male and female. I mean, you've got... I see it really one-sided, but I respect your opinion. Of I mean, J- Jazz Jennings was male. Right. Uh, is male. Right. And uh, so a lot of these stories are male to female, female to male. I understand I that. think the data shows that the majority of trans youth are female to male. And so that that was the uh, rapid onset gender dysphoria argument. Well, argument. And I, I also want to add that as far as erosion of parental rights and responsibilities, um, you know, in Washington state, we've seen where uh, 12-year-olds can make these decisions um, to start these therapies without the barrier of parental permission. And California is is moving really in that direction. And then with the application of these school-based health centers through the WISC model, the whole school, whole community, whole child, um, to implement school health clinics on school campuses where that can, I mean, there's already at least one school, um, there was a story, I think in Fox News perhaps, but that was recent where they were talking about, I think it was Nova High School, School, where this was already being administered. And so the idea of, of an automatic assumption almost that parents are not to be trusted. Yeah. I mean, a lot of CSC material, you can review it and there's a small segment that does say, talk to your parents. Sometimes there's even a, a, a you know, a section that has them go home and discuss things with their parents. But by and large, the message is talk to a trusted adult, talk to a librarian. And it it really does. The majority of the conversation is this message of don't trust the parents. And so if we, yeah, if we get to a place in California and if that spreads nationwide, as California goes, so goes the nation, then we will have an erosion of parental involvement 
in the decisions of healthcare needs of children. So I'll bring this to a, a uh, modern contextual story. There is a man in Texas who has a son. His son, he says, is not trans. The mother says the son is trans. Mm -hmm. the she has taken the child to California where she has now given gender affirming sanctuary. What if he's wrong? What if this woman is suffering Munchausen's by proxy? What if the father is right? The obvious answer is non-intervention for the safety of the child. However, what's happening is the courts are going the other direction. If desistance rates are 60, 95 percent and the mother has taken the child to California and the child does undergo transition, there is a greater than chance percentage that child will suffer because of it. But the child and the law protects her. Is our, OK, but here's where I feel like, in my opinion, and this is like a, a bold claim because you are well read and well studied. But I do question if you're misinterpreting these these studies because the child is trans. So they're already at. We don't know that. No, but we do. <laughs> it's like we do because the child is saying it. No, it, no, 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 no. The child is not. In this I, circumstance. OK, so the mom says yes. There's, a, says there's no. a video. There's a video of the kid saying, I don't want to do this. Oh, well, then, no, that's a bad idea. So it's OK. And the kids, but, uh, the kids, five, seven, five, between five. And, I think this started when the kid was three. No, OK, so when, boom. When, Mar when Mario Lopez yeah. came out and said three year olds cannot determine their gender, he had to come out and apologize for saying that. Because in a way, gender isn't fully understood. But th in that case, we need to allow kids to like an experiment with different things, in my opinion. But that idea of I know so many circumstances where the mom is supportive of a trans kid and the dad isn't. And if the kid is saying they're trans and. Then they're trans and then they're already at risk. But what if they're just confused? Well, what so, do you mean confused? Let, 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 let me ask you a question. Uh, yeah. Going back to the makeup point. Yeah. You choose to wear makeup. This is true. Why don't you choose to wear a jester cap? Okay. Um, I find this is, I like this line of questioning. Um, I choose to wear makeup because this is how I'm comfortable and I don't choose any other type of visual <laughs> kind of stimuli because this is the look that kind of represents who I am. So if ch if children want to wear makeup, do we ask the question, why aren't the children choosing to dress up like bananas instead? That's a great question. And <laughs> here's where well, the answer is fairly obvious. Well, I don't know, actually, because for me, I if my student wants to go to school dressed up as a banana. But they don't. But they if they want to, they can. Right. But, so yeah. the so the issue is social imitation, mimicry and indoctrination. That was it. Oh, OK. Now I see where you're going with a child. Okay. OK. Behaviors they they only can typically acquire from other people. A thousand so percent. OK. There, so there is creativity. I would say uh, typically you find uh, deviations around 20 percent in most things. Right. It's funny. It works with electrons. It works with people. Right. And so a child may take all of these different ideas that he's mm -hmm. seen, she's seen, and then create an amalgam of, percep uh, of a perception of the world. Right. And then from that, create something unique and creative saying, yeah. I want to dress up in a jester's cap because it's a unique and strange thing. You get, you know, punk rock, right. people with mohawks trying to be shocking. Right. But typically children are just seeking to imitate. Right. So when you go to a, a, a group of children as an adult man wearing makeup, mm -hmm. you are going to be giving these kids the concept of adults wear makeup. Right. Men wear makeup and right. they'll adopt those social behaviors more yeah. likely than create a new one. Fascinating that you should bring this up because one, I like one, I've actually never had a student try makeup after seeing me. It's it's never happened, right? Well, but you don't know where they'll be in five years. I don't. I, mean, a year and a I a thousand percent don't. But with that said, my perception that I give, the imitation, the the right that, that's gonna occur is not men should wear makeup. Not and again, I'm using the word man because biologically male, but I do identify as non-binary, right? But that idea of not you need to wear makeup. It's it's an option, right? And I think that's fair, right? And I think that's what a lot of people have issue with. It's like you can't wear makeup around kids because you're going to indoctrinate them. That idea of like no, kids know it is an option. Like well, I, I, yeah, I'm 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 very anti makeup. Yeah, well, I, and that's completely and that's fine, right? Not, not for social reasons though. Yeah. Okay. I, tell me. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, uh, Typically, petrochemicals okay. that result in negative health effects for, I got for you. people. I got you. And, uh, uh, you know, there, there's a, a woman that I met recently who got mercury poisoning, got being you. a model doing makeup. And so I see this as a social practice that has only a net detriment, doesn't really provide any positive. I'm not I'm not a fan of, of adult women get caked up in makeup. It's I got just, you. And we could say the same thing about alcohol, right? But in the end, people's oh, yeah. choices are people's choices, right? You want to wear makeup, you wear makeup. But you don't you tell change. kids. To, to, to drink, do it, to drink you don't, and, and you don't tell kids to wear makeup either. And that's the, and I think that's where the distinction is. And I, so, so my position is not that uh, anybody who want, uh, if you want to wear makeup, I really, really don't care. Right. I'm not saying people sh uh, shouldn't be allowed to wear makeup around children. Women do it too. A right. kid may identify, a male child may identify with a female child. Right. My, my position is simply, 
there are things that have no positive benefit and only a net detriment, detriment. that children will adopt, be it drinking or uh -huh. doing anything else. But I don't believe wearing makeup is nearly as bad as drinking. I'm not there we to go. Say that. Yeah, you already got me. Right. Well, and I was going to say with regards to social mimicry, um, I agree with that. Um, input often equates in a way to output. Um, kids do observe. They're very observant and curious. And I think what you feed tends to grow, even as we are adults. I think this is why marketing is so successful. And that's why people have huge marketing budgets, because you can convince somebody to eat that burger and get that vaccine. Whoa. You can convince somebody. <laughs> uh, that was you can... an unintentional idol. I apologize. That was, very, that was very judgmental of me. And it probably was on camera. Well, and we I do apologize. But it's true. Um, and I think oh, even education, um, marketing is, is tremendously involved in education. And I believe we're often getting a bait and switch. I was recently at a conference in Philadelphia. I got there a few days early. There was a big education conference going on. Most of what um, was being discussed, I got to visit with some of these wonderful people who were there, but they did say one of the primary things that they're working on is marketing to the schools, then marketing to the staff and the parents. And then... Um, that's that's the whole focus. So I think we need to be analytical of of the marketing coming in. But when you're a child, the it, with your developmental ages and stages that you're going through, the the input received, I think that's a, and I actually think we agree with regards to this because um, you know there are teachers that do want to promote. They do want to encourage exploration. I, you know, this happened to a friend of mine. We heard of uh, Abigail Schreier's leaked audio story from a, a training that occurred. And th that audio was shared on the Megyn Kelly show. And I think there are some that do indeed want to promote this. Um, there was a a teachers union a YouTube video where they did this video um, discussing uh a variety of topics, but one teacher said teaching is completely political in all aspects and realms. Everything I do is political from the books I choose and everything that I center in class. And so do we have an epidemic of uh, that growing in education? I do think that's what parents are noticing, which goes back to curriculum choices and all kinds of things. But, there's but a, sorry, yeah. oh, excuse no, me. No, no, no go ahead. I'm so go ahead. sorry. No, but, I'm, but there's so many more teachers that are, get, see, like, we are like, oh, there's this group of people that are like, there's a whole bunch of teachers that are trying to make your kids chance. There's so many more teachers that are against it. There's so many more parents that are against it. There's like, uh, uh, and but, the, but the Department of Education and the teachers unions are in favor. But of it. my issue is, and this is not an accusation towards you individually, nor you, but kind of into a general group of people that play the victim that it's and you're not the victim, right? These people that are like, oh, poor us. You're making our kids trans. No, we're not. We're the minority population and we're not. And these teachers that you keep bringing up, in my opinion, they're not actually LGBTQ. Right. And like, if you, if no, you yeah, not, they're, they're, they're no. not. That's actually the we, crazy we, one. We, I we, didn't buy that book. We, I didn't call buy them. It. Uh, they're, they're, they're called awfuls. Like, like oh, God. Well, affluent white female I, liberals. Okay. I so, do think there's a lot of really. <laughs> just, I, I just want to say this. Like probably on camera too. <laughs> I do think there's a lot of great school staff and teachers that are not doing this. Right. And. And I think that we need those voices, but from the school staff that I know, um, especially because the teachers unions are so loud um, with some of this, I think they're they're intimidated to speak up. And we need those voices to say, hey, I'm seeing well, something saying something. Do you want to address wrong. that? Well, I was I'll, just going to say, like, the only thing I would say, though, is that the, you know, what, you know how, who else is super loud is, and I don't even like using this word because I feel like it's so out of context, like that the word bigoted really bugs me now because now it's like you say anything and it's like bigoted right but like the actual dictionary definition of the word bigoted that probably, bigoted people are also very very loud no matter what i do they're loud as hell well which right? dictionary definition are you referring to let's actually pull it up i want to see right because the principal definition is someone intolerant of another person's beliefs or there opinions. you go right so beliefs and opinions right so bigot someone intolerant of a person's belief and opinion let's go with and I, i'm allowed to say this right like uh like TikTok, for example, right? If you check out their Instagram page, they say, you know, we want to do a pride collaboration, right? I do a pride collaboration, teaching pride in the classroom. What does it look like, right? And I'm like, whoa, teaching pride in the classroom. I'm a learning specialist. Well, like, what do you mean by that, right? And they're like, well, whatever you do for pride lessons. And I'm like, well, this is the closest thing I do to pride lessons. And it's literally having a student draw something on the front of their binder. And it could be who they are. It could be how they feel. It could be what they like to do. And that's pretty much as close to a pride lesson as I give. Or where I have a 
student draw their family, and then a student draw another family that looks different. But people were calling me and, and oh, you're indoctrinating well, have, kids. Have you ever been to a Pride of, You've been to a Pride event, right? I've been, yes. I, oh, yeah, I've been to most of them, actually, yeah. Uh, where, is there, you're from California, do you typically go to like California Pride? Oh, San Francisco Pride all the way, let's is go. It, is it child appropriate? That's a really great question. Have you been to San Francisco Pride before? Not San Francisco, I've been to San LA. I adore San Francisco Pride. Is it and appropriate for children? That is, I'll get there because I have to answer your question honestly. And I know people that work for San Francisco Pride and I have gone every single year. In fact, my moms used to take me when I was a kid. Oh my God, indoctrinating. It is different now. It is very, very different. And in my opinion, San Francisco Pride needs to have different sections. And if you actually went to San Francisco Pride, you would be fascinated by one of the organizations that you would actually type in, which is Gays Against Grooming, which is that idea of if Pride events are Pride events for kids, they need to have a certain level of appropriateness to them. And I agree with that. I agree with that because there are certain things that occur. Yep, right there, right there. Like there are certain things at Pride events that are not age appropriate for these kids. are not that that aren't even legal in many circumstances yeah but are are not in not, they're not enforced the, a thousand percent despite the fact that uh in west virginia for instance it right. is overtly illegal to have child at a drag performance right. there's no law enforcement against it but they do it in public right and the police do literally nothing well, this is what's fascinating to me is like and i also want to get your opinion on this too is like there's this weird false equivalence that is not real like this to me Nope, I would not show my kids that. There's no way. My future kids could not see that. My students would not be allowed to see that. Absolutely freaking not. Are how, you kidding me? How old were you when you went to your first Pride event? Oh, I was like four. I was 10. Uh, how old are you now? I'm 29. Okay, I'm 37. So uh, I don't know, whatever. Uh, you you uh, at a younger age went to a Pride yeah. event. My my uh, mother would not let me, my mom would not, not let me go outside of our family. We had a coffee shop on, yeah. in uh, North Halstead. Right. She told me to stay inside. I wasn't allowed to go outside during Pride and they at were 10 years old yeah, and because they were naked men and women. Mm -hmm. They were performing overt sex acts and simulated sex acts. Yeah. And my whole life, that has always been the case. Yeah. So when that is the case for yeah. from in my in my life, right. basically three decades that every Pride I have mm -hmm. ever been to is sexually explicit. Mm -hmm. When you then go to children and say, let's talk about Pride, mm. you can't have three decades oh, of sexually gosh. explicit in right? public, overtly right? illegal, and then tell children, right? let's, let's bring you into this. Because they're inherently correlated in your mind. They're inherently correlated in your mind. Maybe they should be, but they're not correlated in mine, right? And I know that's crazy to think about now is having but this conversation. It's, it's, it's not about yeah. whether it's in my mind inherently correlated, it's yeah. that if you say, let's have you talk about pride and let me right. teach you about pride and, and pride then pride events is, is right. You are, you are, th this, this, this is what's is called is, grooming. But this is not pride. That is not pride. That is a pride parade. Right. right. And that's different than what pride is, right? Pride is being who you are, in my opinion. That's being who you are, respecting everyone, understanding and people so look different. The, that's pride. What is effectively happening is, whatever your intention may be, right. you are going to a child and saying, I would like to open this door to a world of inappropriate behaviors to you by right. introducing you to this concept. Right. And that's that's why people call it grooming. Right. So the the misconception I would say with the I'm left. I'm starting or, to finally understand what people are like worried about. I don't agree with it, but I'm fully understanding <clears throat> the perspective because I never I didn't understand it to this extent. But to, sorry, just to clarify before you continue. Pride to me, I'm thinking, oh, it's pronouns. It's accepting who you are. It's being kind to everyone regardless. But to you, teaching pride is inherently teaching pride parades, which is intentionally teaching this which is sexual. Not necessarily. You, right, but that's what I'm kind of hearing. Yeah. It's, it's all under a, a, the same umbrella with, with no pushback from the LGBT community. In fact, celebration of. Not gays against grooming. Gays it's, against groomers we're very familiar with, we're fans of, we're okay. friends with. There we go. So, but So this is why it's grooming. I'll break it down. Uh, I'll give you an example of traditional grooming. Okay. A man shows up, uh, sees, a, sees a teenage girl at, yep. at the mall with her parents. Right. He walks up and says, I work for a modeling agency. Right. Your daughter is tall, is slim, mm -hmm. could be one of these Victoria's Secret mm -hmm. models. How would you like to be world famous, travel the world? Take my card, look at my website. Mm -hmm. If this is right for you and you think it's good for your kid, that the, the father goes, wow, really? My daughter could be famous and be a star and be right. a model like on the TV. There's two potentialities in this scenario. Yeah. A legitimate modeling agent sees a teenage girl who could be a wonderful model and genuinely wants her to just do regular old right. modeling. Maybe it's even lifestyle. Lifestyle right. is when they wear overalls and they're like right. merchandising. Or, or <laughs> he says, we're going to bring your daughter. Come on down. And the father is there with the daughter as she does a normal photo shoot. And it seems all above board. They do this for a few weeks. Eventually, 
the father's like, ah, you, you, you can go, you yeah. know, we know what you're doing. I got to be at work. Right. And then, then, then the guy says, we're doing swimsuit today. Mm -hmm. A month later, he says, now we're doing lingerie. Mm -hmm. A month later, we're doing nude. That's grooming. Right. A when, thousand percent. When something seemingly may be normal, but the person is being right. pulled in for the intent of, yeah. of, of putting them in a particular situation. This is the traditional grooming that most people know about, right. casting couch and things like this. Right. Now, the issue with pride is that uh, uh, there is no upper with the modeling world. There is a, an upper level of legitimate above board modeling. Right. You can be a superstar. You could be on TV. They're not trying to get you to do porn. Right. With pride, the upper level is men are performing sex acts on each other in public in, and, and defended by the LGBT I community. would never say that that, uh, first of all, in my opinion, there's no levels of gayness, right? <laughs> no, no, what, 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 but I understand, I completely understand what you're saying. Uh, what I'm saying is right. the, the, the two paths in terms of quote unquote modeling is the deviant right. of trying to trick a, a child or groom them into right. prostitution right or just being on the cover of a magazine which is crazy but, but I, yes the most pronounced experience of pride is for the for 30, 37 years i've been alive yeah from the 27 years since i have witnessed these yeah they are overtly sexual yeah north halstead chicago i'm told my whole life love is love I, i'm a little kid is, my family's liberal democrat yeah and they said we agree with gay marriage we agree with all of this because people are allowed to love whoever they want Right. And then I said, how come the mannequins are giving each other blowjobs in, in full view of the public? Right. What does that have to do with love? Right. I'm like 10 years old and right. I'm like, it's not. They, they have penis and vagina macaroni and cheese. Right. It's not about love. Right. So when you go to a child and say, I want you to, to entertain pride mm -hmm. and the public facing prominent community is overtly sexual. Mm. That's why people are calling it grooming. Got it. Now, here's the deal. Right. And I let's make sure like the microphone gets it like LGBTQIA. We're not pedophiles. That's a pedophile. There's a difference between a pedophile and someone gay. Well, and, do, do yeah. you think these two men performing BDSM in public are pedophiles? No, because they're clearly gay. They are gay. They're doing something. And here's here's where, and this I was so looking forward to like talking to you about because I, like, I've heard some of like, and I wouldn't call them accusations, but like some statements made by you, right? Where that idea of like, if you do this, then therefore like you're a pedophile or you're against, you know, da, 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 da. But it's like, they're not, they're gay. They're gay. There is unfortunately a misunderstanding though of what's appropriate to do around kids and what is not. And hear me out, like love to both of my moms, right? Um, there was parts of Pride that I was not allowed to go to, right, as a kid, right? Because they were not appropriate. And I think there are parts of Pride that are appropriate for kids and parts of Pride that are not appropriate for kids, right? There was a Pride event and you're going to literally like destroy me on this one because you're gonna be mad. You're gonna be mad too. There was a school, there was a school district pride event that we had. And I was like the person for it. I was like the spokesperson for it. And like, hear me out. It was a great event. It was a really great event. We had different booths and the entire pride event was be who you are. There was nothing sexual about it. We had an individual. Um, I don't even know if I could say her name, if that's a good idea to say her name. We had an individual. She came, she told her story about like, what it was like to transition. And I had to coach her a little bit, even though she was older than me and much more successful about, you know what? You actually can't say that you were considering suicide in front of kids. You know what? You can't actually go through the medical procedure in front of kids. There is totally a way to make pride child appropriate. And I respect your understanding that there are certain things that children should not see. And I understand your concern, both of your concerns. If the, but it's possible. It is, we can make pride appropriate. We if, can. If the only thing that exist, existed in modeling was prostitution. Right. That the su supermodels we all know about were- Are all prostitutes. All prostitutes. Then you don't let your child model, right? And the same thing. I, I love your points. Ah, right? Uh, yes, right? And if it was only prostitution, there's no way your child should model ever. And if being gay and being LGBTQIA was only about sex, then there's no way you would expose that to well, kids. Well, no, I, well- and yet, right. and yet it's not always about sex. LGBTQIA actually isn't about sex. And I know that's ridiculous to consider, but I had this conversation with a friend the other day. LGBTQIA, gender identity, lesbian, gays, bisexuals, gender fluids, non-binary. It's sex is actually a very small part of the equation. But but my point is pride events, I have I have never seen a public pride event that wasn't that that was appropriate for children i'll invite you to my next time um, well, I mean, no, I'm, I'm totally messing with you but but, but and, and look I'm, I'm not saying they don't exist i say, say I, do, i've yeah. never seen one because and i'm sure there are some where they just march down the street and they have flags wanna, and things like yeah, that yeah i want to know something and oh gosh and i'm not gonna because uh, I, I was actually told by the district to not actually make it a big deal because they don't want too much media attention especially in hiring me but want to know something this was a really big topic of conversation
at the Pride Event Book because we were sponsored by a library. Mm. Right? And, and they have that in, 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 in accessible to, uh, children can access gender queer. Uh, yeah. So here's where it got very interesting, right? Is that we got this book recommended to us by the students that were, um, right? Mm. I looked at this book and I'm like, of course, as always, I read through it and I'm like, you know what? Amazing read. Amazing, amazing read. I agree. Right? Great read. Conservatives it, don't read it and they should. It's a great book, right? But with that said. Have you read it? No. It's yeah. very interesting. But we have some. I don't think I could show this on camera. I've seen a lot of others, though. Right? We have some seriously graphic images, right? I mean, the, it, uh, I don't know if I could even show this. No, one. Like, no. <laughs> no. But we have some like, graphic we show, images, look, right? We, we, can't, we can't show this on a freaking podcast. On that, YouTube. On YouTube, yeah. right? Now, with not, that not said, hear me, and I will tell you the story. I supported my students getting this from parents if the parents thought that it was appropriate for them. But we, as a group, we had a whole group meeting about this. We were actually like, we actually can't have this book at the Pride event. There are kids that are under the age of 10. Mm. Guess what happened? We did not have a book at the Pride event. We invited a library. Guess what book the library brought? They brought this? They brought the freaking book. And that's why people are calling them groomers. And that's why they're calling us groomers. We were a group of gay people and we were like, <laughs> we can't bring this. And the library sent it. But and I'm like, are you kidding me? You're making us look so bad. And it's not us. <laughs> but that, we're not doing it. But that's why there's gays against groomers. That's literally, can I join that group? Like literally, it's <laughs> killing me. Like it's join actually, them, we they, are not, thank they, you. They we get, are not your enemy. We well, are not your enemy. But Some we're, people but we're, yeah. we're friends with gays against groomers. Yeah, like love that. We, we have their their literature and stuff downstairs. Right, right. Because but we're not perpetuating this. We, I would give this to a student if the student won. I, if a student ever, if I thought a student could ever benefit from a book like this and it's a great book, I would talk to the parent about it. I would get the child perspective. I would talk to the psychiatrist about it. I would talk to the coach about it. I'm a learning specialist. I don't just give books that have very explicit material like this. It's a good book and I, I would promote this book. I think it's great. But would I have it at a public event for kids under 10? Not necessarily. Was it accidentally there? Yes. Did it cause any problems? Actually, no. It didn't cause any problems. It did not cause anyone to be gay. It wasn't a problem in the end, right? But in the end, I just want to be super clear. We had a meeting about this book and we banned it. As a group of gay people putting on pride in freaking the Bay Area. The, so, so this is the issue. Like, the, the, the argument that all gay people, all LGBT people are groomers is not yeah, correct. It's so wrong. I have people because, that, yeah, that like pretend to be me online. And I'm like, hi, I'm Desmond Fambrini. I'm a groomer. Want to hang out? And I'm like, this is why I had to go off Discord. Because there were so many freaking Desmond Fambrinis. They got that audio clip now. Like, oh my God. <laughs> but but uh, we're, we're, like I said, <laughs> we're friends with gays against groomers. Right. They have a subcategory mm -hmm. trans against groomers. Right. We have uh, fr uh, uh, fa uh, fans and friends of the show who are trans. God. And the big issue is there are certain things that are not appropriate for children. They're not. So if you come out and you're like, you know, you believe in pride and all this stuff, we're mostly like, okay, just, you know, we want to keep certain things away from kids. Right. I agree with you. If, if parents believe that this is appropriate for their children, parents have the final say. Collaboration. To, to, within a certain, to, to a certain extent, right. I don't know, there's a, there's, a, there's a moral line. You don't want parents being like, hustler is appropriate for kids. Right. No, no, no. We intervene there and be like, you clear, clearly crossed, crossed the line. Right. Uh, I, what I always say about this book, Gender Queer, there are a lot of conservatives. There are a lot of, uh, you know, people critical of gender ideology. Mm -hmm. And whenever I, I say, have you ever read it? They go, no. And I'm mm -hmm. like, look, you know, it's not, it takes a 20 minutes. 20 minutes, It's a bro. graphic it's a novel. Good book. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a good book. Yeah. I think it's a good book that explains uh, the problems. And what's fascinating to me is, I'm assuming you think it's a good book because of the perspective of the non-binary individual and everything. I think it's a good book because it explains the psychological torture and torment of I this individual. I think that that is so, such an important facet of this book. Such an important facet, facet of this book, right? And I feel... Wow! See, I knew this was going to be a good but, conversation. But before you yeah. accidentally agree with me, yeah, I'm, well, I'm not fully agreeing with you, right? This is a book about right. a female, right, who was uh, mercilessly abused right. by her parents, right, neglected, psychologically tormented, mm -hmm. and now is suffering from developmental disorders mm -hmm. that are being affirmed right. by modern society to the point where they think it's good children learn and and believe these ideas are correct. But you have a young woman who is pissing in her backyard, yeah. who was never taught to read, mm -hmm. who, who wore for three days in a row dried pads crusted with menstrual blood to the point where she smelled so bad. This is in the book I noticed. that she was made fun of by her classmates and then internalized all of that and said, the real problem is that being a girl sucks. The real problem was your mother and your father abused you emotionally 
and not with direct physical violence, but it was physical abuse. Mm -hmm. Having your child urinate in the yard, mm -hmm. having them wear crusted menstrual mm -hmm. pads for days. Right. This is something where Child Protective Service is supposed to intervene, intervene. And, and save this child. And the child, sh in this book, she talks about how when the other girls made fun of her for not shaving her legs, yeah. for smelling like feces, right. she then said, if only I was a boy. Right. No, 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 no. It's right. not if only you was a boy. It's that your parents abuse you. Right. And so what she does then is she takes this abuse and equates and it with being, being female and right. not she doesn't want to be a man. Right. She doesn't want to be a woman. Right. One thing that I actually take personal offense to, I saw a clip from Billboard Chris where he asked a trans man, how do you know you're trans? Mm. And this biological female who identifies as a man said, you know how you wake up feeling like a man? I wake up feeling like a man. No, I, I don't. I don't wake up feeling like a man. Mm. There is no there is no point of reference for anyone to wake up feeling like anything other than themselves. Right. Okay. But they create this idea of it is better to be an other an assumption of right. the feelings I have, and they want to appropriate that from me without actually understanding it in any way. Right. This woman explains later on in the book that she's actually a fetishist. Right. She's a, what's called an autoandrophile. She has sexually aroused the thought of being a man. You then come to, uh, I think, what you see here is she's a teacher going to children, asking these children to fulfill her sexual fantasy. Whether that's the core reason why she does it isn't the issue. She does. She explicitly says she is sexually aroused to the thought of being a man and then asks children to entertain that thought. That is completely inappropriate. What we have here is someone who has suffered psychological trauma, mm -hmm. who is now pushing that onto children. That is, is, is horrifying to me. Now, here's there's so much that I want to unpack there, but I also want to give you a chance to speak because I think you have such an amazing perspective. And that was such an interesting interpretation of the book, one that I, of course, have different viewpoints of, right? But as you know, I'm very a huge fan of finding common ground, right? And do I think that it's hugely problematic? Do I think that people are trans because of trauma? No, I don't think people are trans because of trauma. I sincerely disagree with you on that. However- Well, she's not trans, she's non-binary. Well, yeah, I know. Like, she rejects She femininity. rejects femininity, right? Um, but like that idea of like, the, the classic idea of like, oh, people are trans, people are gay. Um, because of trauma right and like now there's this movement apologies like just to clarify but now we, we sometimes hear people that are non-binary going under the trans umbrella so i just say like trans for everyone just want to clarify that but with that said even though i very much disagree with a lot of that perspective where it's like oh it was because of trauma and you're pushing it on kids and this is that and the other what i do agree with is there is a conversation that needs to be had that being non-binary and being gay isn't for fun it's actually freaking hard, right? And it can be. And I don't necessarily do this. In fact, I don't do this for fun. I wake up and I do this to myself and I feel like this way and I talk like this and I act like this because this is what feels right for me. And I do think there's a problem in social media, the mimicry idea that you make gay look fun and trendy. And then kids hop on that bandwagon without understanding that there is discrimination that you are going to go through and that there are problems that you're going to go through. But people are born the way they are, in my opinion. So I feel like there's this gray area that is never explored, which is, yes, sometimes people accidentally equate being queer to being different and trendy. But on the other side, there are people that are just queer and we shouldn't just banish uh, like we shouldn't just say oh all gay people are just you know traumatized i was not traumatized i just don't i don't I, yeah I, I don't think people are uh, i think there's a a variety of different people who are trans for different reasons a thousand percent i think the God, uh can, can we just like can we why what can you do to like wind that back right because like that idea of people are trans for different reasons people are non-binary for di that is I, so never talked about i think the principal <sighs> reason my, my view is probably plastic endocrine disruptors uh, a lot of people talk about why it is we're seeing such a, a massive explosion of trans youth and transgender uh, transgenderism. Well, we're like the second generation of plastic. We are the second generation born of plastic products. I went to an antique store. Soda cans were hard metal. Knee high orange soda was a hard metal can mm -hmm. when you like crack open. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, from the 50s. And then uh, the advent of plastics and plastic products are to emerge probably around the late, the, the mid, the, in the 60s, and, mm -hmm. mostly in the 70s. And then you end up with the boomer generation who are now in their late teens and 20s into the 70s consuming products all wrapped and coated in plastic, mm -hmm. PCBs, phthalates, endocrine disruptors that we know to be endo endocrine disruptors, as well as other pesticides and chemicals. You then end up with the boomer generation consuming majority of these chemicals while they have babies in utero. Mm -hmm. And then we're surprised to see that millennials and Gen Z have a higher rate of, of transgenderism. I don't think that's the only reason. But I think 
we've known for some time about uh, uh, phthalates in PCBs, for instance, and the effect on, on babies and the, the endocrine system. Yet, for some reason, there are many people who are associated with the right who would say there are no trans kids. There's no. And I'm like, well, if we well, if, are, if, yeah. if 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 you go back to Alex Jones yelling, they're turning the frickin frogs gay. Yeah, it's been <laughs> literally ten, about to bring that up. Ten years right. of people on the right saying right. that there are chemicals that cause endocrine disruption in 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 life and animals, and it's going to impact us. So the question is is then if someone was trans and they're experiencing gender dysphoria because of endocrine disruption due to the chemicals in our food and an environment, right. how do we adequately accommodate these individuals who through no fault of their own are experiencing this? And that's a great question that I think is like so important to have with parents, with medical staffs, with teachers, and for everyone to be included. But there are trans kids, there are non-binary kids, but that idea of like, people are turning them trans on purpose. It just, it really, it hurts me a little bit, right? Because like, and it probably just cause it like, it hurt, you know when like, um. Like just for an, for an example for you, right? That idea of like, oh my God, I can't believe you didn't tell me something happened to my kid. It's your literal job to protect them. You care about the most. And it's like kind of a slap in the face, right? At least that's the perspective that I would think that you have, right? Like someone, in, someone insults your kid or your kid is says that they're a girl or a boy or whatever. And they don't, you don't tell me I'm their freaking parent. What do you mean you're not telling me? And I get that perspective, but I have the same perspective as like, a t like for as a teacher, Right, that a teacher that wears makeup that's non-binary, that idea of like, I make myself a public figure. I'm live scanned by the state of California. Every move that I do is watched, right? And I, what, make a video? I put on some eyeshadow and you're like, you are indoctrinating my kid. That's such a slap in the face to me in my community. Like I went to school for freaking 25 years. I went to grad school to make sure that I could teach your kid to read the best that they could ever read. I went to school to make sure that your kid has an individualized education program that no one else has because I do custom products for each kid. And you're saying I'm grooming them because I'm wearing lipstick? Like that's such a slap in the face to me. You know, you know what I do find really funny is um, the guests we've had on the show who are not LGBT, but yeah. are like affluent, affluent white liberals right. tend to adamantly defend books like this, uh, tend to adamantly defend this book is be, be, uh, gay being given to children, say it shouldn't be censored. And then whenever we have actual LGBT people, they say, I agree, this stuff's inappropriate. And so it's very interesting that when it comes to issues of race and gender, it yeah. tends to be affluent white liberals yes. who are not members of this community. Which, so, uh, and they're trying their best to support. I want you to. I don't. I don't know if that's. I think they're well, trying their best to get clicks on the internet. Well, it's they're. You know, they're they're trying to support. So, okay, I'll tell you a story. This better not go viral. I swear to God. I swear to God. Um, but I, you know, I feel like people try to be accepting, and sometimes there's a misstep, and it ends up causing a media like corruption, right? So I walk into a school. They hire me. Um, they have a couple students that have a very specific, you know, ADHD diagnosis combined with dyslexia. So very, very tricky to read, right? They bring me in, they hire me. I walk into the school and I go, you know, oh, by the way, can you show me where your bathroom is? And they're like, there's one right there. They point to the girl's bathroom. Oh, wow. And I'm like, oh, like the bathroom, like for adults. Because I don't want to be like, oh, I'm just, I just, am, I'm non-binary. I wear makeup, but I use the guy's bathroom, right? But they're like, it's right there. And like, we're like, they pointed the women's bathroom. They pointed to the girls' bathroom. There's like an eight year old girl who just goes in there, yeah. right? And I'm like, and I want to be polite. I'm like, oh, no, the bathroom for, for adults. And they're like, oh, that one's on the other side of the campus. You could just use that one. And I got where they were coming from because they were like, oh, you know, she probably identifies as a woman and she wants to be included. First of all, I think the bathroom topic is just nonsense. I just think that there should be separate adult and children bathrooms in the first place and that would solve the problem. But that idea of like people are trying their best to accommodate, but sometimes you try to accommodate a little bit too much and not everyone has- That's what they do. Yeah, not, not sometimes you try to accommodate too much and some people like me are, I have to be on my guard all the time, right? So I, I'm like, I'll go to the one across, I've, I've walked the entire school, but like they're trying to help. They are trying oh. to help, but it's accidentally misinterpreted. And then what if I said yes? And there was a picture taken. Oh my gosh, you know, trans teacher goes into a child's bathroom with an eight-year-old. Then there's gonna be a freaking news story on it that is gonna be talked about on this podcast. And do you see how quickly things tumble, right? And that's my issue. Let's, 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 uh, we spent a lot of time talking about gender stuff. We haven't talked about the critical race theory stuff that's in schools. Very interesting. And I, I think, just... yeah, I think that's a, a, an important uh, component as well, obviously, because what we find is there's this really hilarious study a few years ago um, Two of them actually I'll cite. One was white liberals are the only demographic with an outgroup preference. 
Mm-hmm. So black people tend to prefer to be around black people, but it's it's small margins. Surprisingly, yeah. it's like eighteen percent. So it's like slim minority. But you see that you know black people prefer to be around black people, Latinos around Latinos, mm-hmm. white conservatives prefer to be around white conservatives, Asians prefer to be around Asians, and white liberals prefer not to be around white people in general. And I think this is for whatever reason, uh, a, like whatever how for whatever reason they're adopting this, resulting in a lot of the problems that we're actually seeing, in that you end up with these circumstances. Yeah where white people go around calling other people racist, you end up with white liberals calling Larry Elder, a black man, a white supremacist. I got called racist and transphobic on my TikTok page for like a full year. <laughs> <laughs> like, and like, that means you really can't win, can you? <laughs> oh, but look, you like have- For a full year, I was told that I was racist and transphobic, like for a year. Like, I just you, wanna put you, that out there. It's like you can't win. I mean, like, gays against groomers are called homophobic, despite the fact that they're actually gay. Well, it doesn't it's, matter. I think, and again, it's not a, you know, there's parts of the organization that I've heard that I still need to do like some, but it seems like it's a solid organization, that idea of like things are appropriate for certain things and things are appropriate for not. But that idea of like, I want to hear your perspective because hear me out, critical race theory, of course, there's like maybe some issues, but I was on, you know, different shows, different podcasts, different news channels. Do you worry about your kids maybe never seeing people that look different or act different? Or maybe your, your kid hasn't seen someone who looks like me. Right. And then you're going to have and they're, they're going to have an idea. They're going to be nervous. They're going to be worried. They're going to be and or, or they might not be or they might not be. Right now, our, yeah. our kids see a, a lot of diversity. Great. OK. So, so and then well, and so you probably do a very good job at making sure that occurs. Right. But I do get worried in some homeschool situations. It's not even intentional. Right. We have like just geopolitics that get and put, like you said, different people in different areas. But I just get worried when you get to the homeschooling idea where it's like you only have people that look a certain way, act a certain way. And it's limiting. Right. I th- well, I, I don't I don't know. I've me. seen I've seen a, a lot of diversity in homeschooling. Yeah. I mean, there were a lot of families that that just chose to homeschool on their own because they thought they could provide uh, their child a a different education. There's a lot of kids with different special needs. There's all, I mean, all across the the scope of things. I've seen, you know, a lot in homeschool. And I would say that, um, I mean, for me, the homeschool experience has has brought back i mean for example i know i know this isn't talking about critical race theory but i'd been working with our children to read uh prior to them starting preschool and kindergarten and all of those things i was working with them because i've collected books since i was little and i love books um and and so anyways our daughter was making all of this progress prior to entering kindergarten, and then she gets into kindergarten and she's doing this cueing reading where she's having to kind of guess what the sentence is, which is making news right now. And I mean, I think um, after, you know, then we get to first grade, and I even suggested to the teacher because she was bringing home some books that were, you know, as far as literacy, they were behind. Right. And I said, you know, was talking with them and stuff, but she didn't enjoy reading. She mm-hmm. it was it was daunting. She didn't enjoy school. Our son wasn't enjoying school. He wasn't feeling challenged mm-hmm. enough. And and so in any rate, I didn't know how homeschooling was going to go. I had actually told my husband mm-hmm. in December when I fail at this, <laughs> <laughs> we need a plan B. We need a plan B. And it was a mm-hmm. it's still a shock to me how well it's gone, but what ended up happening is a couple months in our kids were on their own reading and they were reading all different kinds of books and chapter books. And I remember looking to my husband and the kids were in the back of the car and I said, look, the kids are reading on their own. <laughs> and and they just loved it. And so, I mean, I feel like education, I mean, California's education has really gone downhill. Um, I, I think n- nationwide, you know, there's just been... A, a, a complete shift in in educational topics and different things. But I think the thing that gets me is if kids aren't reading, if they aren't able to do math, math was a challenge to me when I was when I was younger, um, even in college a little bit. But all of these topics, I, I mean, I want kids to love learning. And I, I can tell that from you as well. Right, absolutely. And I, I want kids to be able to just develop. And and I think right now, I don't know, it's it's been a, a very, this is completely unintended journey for me. Yeah, I never in a million years thought I'd be doing this. Oh, yeah. But um, 
you know, with regards to like, like California's ethnic studies. Um, for me, it was looking at that material and then trying to think through, um, like, who is Franz Fanon, Wretched of the Earth, um, you know, some of the source documents. It's new for parents to hear about all the, these different critical theories. You know, the source documents that I looked at, you know, it mentioned queer theory, lat crit theory, critical race, uh, critical race theory, and all of these different things. And then the content you know, trying to look through some of the materials from the curriculum, they were teaching kids how to be an activist, um, how to develop a counter narrative to a narrative, um, all different kinds of things. And I feel like, you know, for my part, I think in some ways education has lost its way. And I kind of get the impression that we agree on quite a bit. It's very interesting. Um, oh, yeah, a thousand percent. I on want you some to finish, things. Though. I mean, not on everything. Not on everything, but it's very interesting but, that you um, say that. You know, I, I, I just think with, with ethnic studies, this idea of, of the politicized part of it, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I initially heard ethnic studies and I thought fabulous. Yeah. And we're, I think it's really, really well, important. and I, I thought we're going to be learning about all these different, um, ethnicities and we're going to learn about people's cultures and all of these things. But then I saw Antonio Gramsci and I did see a reference to Karl Marx and I'm going, Okay, okay. <laughs> that's so not what I anticipated. Right. And I think you bring up like a really interesting point and just like, okay, here's where I think we agree and also like where we disagree is I think things like gender theory, critical race theory, you know, gender studies are all like so important because in the end, I feel critical thinking is the skill that we need to teach kids to be able to think critically, differentiate points, figure out things on their own, right? I feel like that is key. And that's why it really hurts me when people are like, we need to just ban critical race theory. We need to ban gender studies. No, these are the studies that are really important because you're thinking critically about societal issues. However, where I think a little bit of the misstep, like you said, happened is we started prioritizing critical thinking before we taught the fundamentals, right? And if you teach critical thinking before teaching the fundamentals of reading math science, you accidentally insert your own opinions into teaching critical thinking as an educator. And that's where the misstep is, in my so, opinion. I, I think but the issue I, mostly you know is I mean? like, critical race theory is rooted in Marxism, quite literally. In the founding rooted. document of critical race theory, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw explicitly said Karl Marx got critical theory right, but doesn't understand the racial component in the United States. So, the, so what they're doing is they're not teaching kids about uh, understanding, you know, the history of this country. For one, 1619 is, a, is, is mostly a fabrication, even uh, what's her, I can't remember the woman's name who, who uh, wrote it said it wasn't intended to be accurate history. Uh, you end up with these ideological curriculums in math and science that create a false a false picture of what is really going on with race relations, indoctrinating kids into the idea of oppressed versus oppressor, which creates an antagonistic society. And then people always vote to be the oppressed as opposed to the oppressor. Well, it's right? because the oppressed are actually the oppressor. Right. Well, those those. Available, but I understand your point. But it, but it is those yeah. of victimhood today are granted special privileges. For instance, if you are perceived as being oppressive, you get banned from social media. So the interesting thing is the victim exerts this tremendous authority over everyone else to fall in line lest they be removed mm -hmm. from from society. Mm -hmm. So those pretending to be oppressed are actually the oppressors. You know, you, you have this story out of the UK of the 16 year old girl who called a cop a lesbian. She gets arrested for it. Oh, I saw those that police are the oppressors. A, a, a 16 year old autistic child making an off the cuff comment, which you find offensive, does not warrant the arrest of that child. But the person, the police officer, they, they then claim that these officers are uh, victims of hate crimes. <laughs> no, they're an oppressive force who are targeting a child for saying something stupid. What we end up seeing in these schools is first, I think the important thing is critical race theory as written by Camilla Crenshaw is Marxism. Marxism, I think, is very, very bad in a lot of ways because it pits people against each other and creates disunity. Uh, in the schools, you end up with these really weird circumstances. We have a bunch of these books actually on our shelf outside that were given to us by uh, our, many of our guests. They do things like this. <clears throat> this is this is the issue with critical race theory. If you're going to go to a bunch of kids in Florida and say, let's teach about the history of slavery in the North Atlantic slave trade and give you a full view of it. Mm -hmm. For one, anybody who brings up an element of slavery that doesn't adopt the worst view of it will be attacked for bringing it up. For instance, if you bring up that many slaves worked in shops and received money, 
they'll say that you are downplaying what slavery was because slavery was always the most abusive and intolerant thing. Now, slavery was bad, but it was many different things. It was very bad. <laughs> right. It's, 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 it's considered a, a moral failing. In it, a, was a, in a, it was like one of the greatest moral failings of like the human population. And but it still it, exists. Yeah. But it does banning it. But no one's, no one's banning telling kids about slavery. In fact, I would make the argument that those who are banning discussions of slavery are actually on the left. Okay. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Your, I see your point. I see your point. But I disagree, if, but I see your point. If you have uh, someone tell the story of uh, many slaves in the South, for instance, you read, I've, been, I read, I've been reading a lot about the Civil War. Uh, when you ask someone, what was a slave? Imagine a slave. Mm -hmm. They're going to imagine a, a man in a field being mm -hmm. beaten by a plantation owner. Mm -hmm. What they're... If you then come out and say, did you know that many slaves were actually working jobs and received money for what they did? They'll say, that's insane. You're a lot. You're wrong. They dismiss the, the. But this is an important conversation about, say, Frederick Douglass. When you learn the stories of slaves who bought their freedom, they worked hard. They did receive money, but they were fully controlled in every element of their life by a slave master. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. But many, many of these individuals were working in shops because it facilitated the business of the, the white slave owner. And in some instances, not even white Native Americans and other black people had slaves too, not the majority. But uh, they would be able to receive compensation. Granted, the person who owned the slave would receive more or receive fees. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a much broader picture. You hear stories about a teacher who would bring something like this up and then get attacked and canceled by the left for it. A thousand percent. But yeah. the bigger issue is we see these books where instead of saying, Let's teach you about the history of slavery. It's a math book. Yeah. And the math book says Jamal has been stopped by police 17 times this month where Eric and it shows a picture of a black man and a white man. Eric was only stopped once. What percentage of the stops were, you know, uh, uh, of the young black male we're racially Jamal? racially biased, right? Yeah. And so what they're doing is they're creating these math problems mm -hmm. that create an, an, a worldview that indoctrinates this oppressed versus oppressor narrative. Which in a very much... All fascinating points as always. But it very much though, I do worry about kind of an inherent issue where <clears throat> I remember very specifically, like really quick side note, I remember in first grade being taught about slavery. And one of the key things that was always said to me in slavery units was, but you know that, you know, Africans actually were the ones that were selling other Africans, right? And I felt, and I didn't understand it at that time. Right. And now with my education, I understand, well, that they had a very different idea of what slavery was when Africa, you know, the idea of trading people that we had very different. It was a very big miscommunication. Right. But in the end, you were just stealing people. Slavery is bad. I really got to underline that. Right. But I do get worried if we say, oh, you know, well, they were also earning wages and they were also they could buy their freedom. And this is that. And the other. I do get worried that we somewhat downplay the severity of how bad slavery was. Now, is critical race theory perfect? No. Is Marx actually worth studying? Yeah, Marx is. But like, in my opinion. Um, but it, it's tricky to me because there should be an awareness that there is racial bias. There should be, right? There, And I think it's important. And I think it's tricky to kind of get everyone to understand that without putting it in curriculum consistently, right? I do want my students to know that I have encountered police officers a bit more frequently, quite more frequently than my white counterparts. Being how do you in, know that? Well, that's actually a great question. Um, and on, so how do I know that holistically or how do I know that just in my personal experience? Both. Great question. Uh, personal experience, right? Like for example, I will be walking down, I don't know if you know like Waterworld USA and like, the, right, we have to go there. And I always remember I like hated going because there was always like security everywhere. I would always be asked to show my freaking receipt. And it's so funny because my mom would always be like, keep your receipts. And I never understood why. And it's because I was always the one. Whenever I'd be walking around with like a bag of candy or like a toy or whatever, the, an officer would stop me, do you have a receipt for that? And not like my in, friend. In the store. In the store. No, outside the store. When you leave the store, like right? In public. They'd leave say. the store in public, right? Or in like the water park. Do you have a receipt for that? And I, dang right I do. And I would keep going my way, right? But it was odd. It was weird to me how I would consistently be like, oh, well, you know, you need to prove this, you need to prove that, you need to prove the other. And it, it didn't happen to my white friends. And I do want my students to understand that there is a difference in kind of treatment, right? Now, how we implement that in a curriculum is very, very difficult, right? And I think this is actually 
where and I'm not speaking like for you at all. But like, I think in looking at like this content that I've seen from yours is I think that this is where you're accidentally misinterpreted sometimes. Because I think you say things like I'm against like critical race theory, I'm against this or and that's against that. And you're not against teaching the ideas of it, but you're more for the idea of the individuality and individual perspective. I I'm pro teaching critical race. theory. I actually didn't know that. So that, yeah. that idea, right? I'm, I'm against uh, um, critical race uh, uh, praxis. Okay, so see that, and I think that's where we the call it crap. Yeah, that's the <laughs> that's where the differentiation, CRP. right? That's carp, where the differentiation takes place. Where I think you're sometimes taking it out of context, where you appear and then people are like, "He's trying." Oh, to they're lying. Yeah, they. I know they are, right? But that idea of like, I think people don't give the other side the time of day because I think there is a way to really individually teach slavery, what happened, what the implications were. I even think, get ready, let's start a tussle, right? Because we're getting still along a little bit too well, right? Like I even think there's a way to kind of implement affirmative action to the point where it is beneficial. But I don't think that there should be a point system. We struck that down in a previous Supreme Court case. I don't think that somebody black should inherently be looked at thinking, oh, you are always going to have a struggle that is more intense in every circumstance. There are certain circumstances, but not all, right? And I think that's important to teach. I think it's important to take that into consideration for college <clears throat> admissions. I think having a class that is more diverse is going to be inherently more beneficial, right? But I think it needs to be done very, very carefully. And maybe we did a rush job at kind of you, doing that. Yeah. You said you're 51% Italian? I am. Do you have one white parent, one black parent? I do, yes. So uh, I'm curious your experience, like which which one of your parents is is white? So my mom, white. My mom actually passed away. That was my biological mom, but Sorry, she was white. No, thank Sorry. you. I oh, appreciate it. Um, she was she was purebred Italian. Um, hundred percent. So I'm fifty one percent Italian. She was blonde hair, blue eyed, and then my dad, who kind of out of the picture, very out of the picture. Um, he was black, right? Which is like, of course, you kind of like, well, see, this is the problem, and like this okay. is that and the other, and you kind of get that whole perpetuated like, well, this is the stereotype, right? But so you you yeah. grew up. Uh, when you grew up, you had two moms or one mom passed away young? So one mom passed away and I grew up, two moms were separated. My biological mom I actually lived with for a while and then kind of became an adult. Then she passed away, but I still have my other mom in my life. But with that said, I, I assume your question to be like, well, who'd you grow up with? Like, what was your family look like? Italians, right? They're very much Italians. However, my mom's made sure to also raise me with people that looked like me. And when I started dancing in the fifth grade, I was, you know, taken, I was on a dance team in Oakland and I got to, you know, learn about that aspect of my culture and what that was like. And that was very important for me to have both of those kind of experiences to draw from. Also, my second mom is Japanese, right? So I also had that <laughs> culture. You speak right? Japanese? Oh my God. See, so hear, hear <laughs> me out. Not only did I suck at learning Japanese, even though like I remember my grandmother speaking Japanese, not only was I not allowed to, like not only did I suck at learning Japanese, but then the, what I was actually good at was Italian mm -hmm. and I wasn't even allowed to speak that because Italians were not very fond and people were not very fond of Italians in San Francisco and we were immigrants. Oh. So like we were not allowed to speak Italian in the family. My grandparents wouldn't teach us. So you have, I, I know sign language, I'm fluent, but oh really? <laughs> no, yeah. huh. But um, but no Italian or Japanese. Sadly, the, the reason I ask is because uh, I come from a mixed race background. Everyone yeah. knows it's a meme. Right. My dad's a white German Irish guy. Right. My mom's a Hapa. She's right. uh, half Korean, uh, forty percent Korean, ten percent Japanese. Cool. We learned that it's uh, uh, through DNA testing. Yeah. And typically, when when I tell people I'm Korean and Jap, I'm I'm part Korean, they go oh, a little bit Japanese. They go oh, because the implications historically. But uh, the reason I bring it up is. I grew up in this uh, uh, with these experiences of racism. We had uh, our, our house was attacked a couple times by right. uh, white supremacists or whatever you describe right. it as. Putting they put pamphlets on our doorstep saying race mixing was wrong. Right. And we should be ashamed, and you know the kids are mongrels and things like that. Right. Then I have this dad who is clearly not in agreement with these right. ideas. He marries a Korean woman, and uh, then when he goes to work, he's he's told that because he's white, he's mm -hmm. privileged and not allowed to receive certain uh, standard things. Mm -hmm. Right. He wanted to uh, get a promotion in, you know, the fire department. They passed him up because they wanted a lower, uh, a lower, uh, someone who got lower on, on the on the uh, promotions test, but who happened to be a, an ethnic minority. Mm -hmm. So my dad, who is someone who absolutely resists the racism, is mm -hmm. punished by mm -hmm. this system. Then I, as a child in a mixed race family who is being threatened and targeted by racists, mm -hmm. suffer because of it. Right. Mostly, I would, I would, I'm not going to like I, suffering is relative for the most part, I would I would say <clears throat> growing up in a, you know, like lower middle class family or upper lower class, everyone would describe it. Life was life. Right. It was what it was. But my, I know that my life would have been better had they not discriminated against my father. And then because they did caused uh, they basically held back a family, a mixed race family because one family member happened to have been white. Hmm. That's affirmative action. And I grew up with that, and that's why I uh, like firmly opposed it in the entirety. Mm -hmm. The idea that you would say, 
This man's white, therefore he's privileged, therefore he can't get these benefits. Right. And he's actually in a part of a mixed race family. Now that right. that minority family suffers because of it mm -hmm. makes literally no sense. It doesn't make sense. And I think you also, and I would even go back to like your original point, which is that idea of like, you know, on this, like on this show, right? You're right, that idea of like, well, you always have to define a word because it means two different things yeah. from like different people, right. right? And one thing for me that I always seem to be running issues into on like on social media is like people that I are like, well, you can only be racist to like right, <clears throat> white people can't be racist, right? And like white people are always the oppressors and this, this, that, and the other. And I gotta say, like, you know, I would push back on that narrative because I think that racism looks different based on the context, right? I think there is systematic and systemic racism in America. I think that does need to be addressed sometimes. But can racism occur on an individual level or on a more systemed level, like, for example, uh, a workplace environment? Mm. Yeah, thousand percent, right? And people are always like, well, no, black people can't be racist. And I go, if I hung a door on my office that said no more white students, that's a black person being racist, yeah. right? So black people can be, right? Black people can be racist to other people. But on, on average, right, we do have one kind of group that tends to oppress the others more frequently. Now, with that said, there are nuanced situations, like you said, right, where somebody that is white that like allegedly, like you said, I don't want to like make any assumptions, but seemed to be more qualified that was passed up. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that occurred. Right. But I do think there are situations where you can take somebody's race into consideration and say, oh, you definitely were more challenged because of this instance without without making it a point system, without saying all white people are doing this or all black people experience this. I don't I don't know. You know, they, they had the Supreme Court ruling. Harvard now says they're still going to take race into consideration for admissions, but yeah. they're going to do it by an essay basis about like write an essay about yeah. how you were oppressed or something. So they're going to find ways to get around it. Yeah. And the, the issue here is you you can't determine whether or not someone is good, bad, smart, stupid, worthy, unworthy by their race. There you can. But he, yeah. Yes. Right. Oh, my God. But so so that means right. in the positive and negative sense. Right. I, I don't think that. Look. Anybody, I have a grocery store. Right. I don't care who you are. You walk in. Right. I want. I want people on security cameras to be paying attention to what right. you're doing. Thousand percent. You can make racially profiled arguments and all that stuff all day and night. I'm like, yeah. Well, I'm not going to give someone the benefit of the doubt to steal from me because they happen to be the other race. That's right. stupid. That is. Then, then a white guy comes in and robs you. Right. But uh, <clears throat> it goes the other way too with Harvard. Telling the, the the way I always describe it is. Whenever someone tells me they're for affirmative action, I say, then I want you to be the one mm -hmm. to look that lower class Asian child in the face right. and tell him you will never be allowed in Harvard because you look like they look. Right. And I think you bring up a very interesting point, and I also want to hear your perspective mm -hmm. too, right? But that idea of it being a touchy subject. And it's very interesting because I, I still remember to this day, um, you know, I don't want to do a story of time to bore anyone, but like I remember in high school, we had to actually make the arguments. Um, we did like the moot court. Did you, anybody do that in high school? Where you did the moot court in high school. I didn't school. go to high school. Oh, right. There you go. Well, we did a moot court, right? Where you had to pick a side and you had to argue like, okay, you're for affirmative action against affirmative action. And I remember specifically that I I wanted to argue against it. And the reason I wanted to argue against it is one, I wanted to get that perspective because, you know, on average, I do think it should be taken into consideration. But two, I thought it was so just ambiguous how affirmative action was being played out, right? To the point where it actually could be accidentally promoting what you're trying to fight it, right? Like accidentally doing what you're actually out to be against, right? Unfortunately. So I thought that these systems were awful. And I think that I think that the point system was terrible. And I think that assuming everyone black has a harder time is a problem. But I do think race should be taken into consideration. And I want to go to your point, which is so amazingly valid, which is you cannot tell if somebody is a good or bad person based on their racial background. However, on average, on average, which I know is dangerous, you can tell how somebody has experienced life or you can tell the treatment someone has received throughout life based on their racial background. I disagree. I And that's okay. And I want to hear that perspective, right? And yeah. I want to hear that perspective. But I know that when, and, and again, um, when I have like my black friends around me, there's a current under, there's an understanding of like how <clears throat> kind of interactions with, let's say, police officers work, but, but, right? But it's an assumption and it's, it a, is. it's an assumption and, and it's, it, it it's, it's, a, it's, it's an average. It's and a, it's, it's, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even necessarily think so. I think tell me. You, you can look at New York, for instance, stop yeah. and frisk overwhelmingly right. targeted right. black neighborhoods. Right. Bloomberg was unapologetic in this. He said, well, that's where the crime is. So we're going to go and we're right. I'm like, first of all, they're doing it under the guise of violating these <laughs> first, people's Second Amendment first rights. First of all. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. The, the argument <laughs> no, for stop and frisk was you're not allowed to have guns. Yeah. Are you kidding? Yeah. I think that's absolutely insane that in this 
Democrat bastion of New York City, the police are targeting minority neighborhoods over whether or not they have guns. And they say, oh, there's a lot of shootings there. So we do it. And I'm like, well, it's a problem, right? Because the Constitution says these people have a constitutional right to keep and bear arms. Mm -hmm. And you passed some law, which I view as completely invalid, mm -hmm. telling people they can't. Mm -hmm. Then they go and they specifically target minority neighborhoods. That I completely understand. But uh, I think the bigger issue is it's mostly about poverty. Mm -hmm. And they, what, what happens is there are reasons why certain neighborhoods are impoverished historically. Uh, and, and this includes a large proportion of uh, 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 African-American or uh, Latino. <laughs> and so what, we, what ends up happening is people like Bloomberg say it's the black neighborhood. I'm like, well, it's actually a lower income neighborhood. It is. A, yes. And again, targeting their Second Amendment right. rights. Oh. But growing up on the south side of Chicago, what was my experience? It, the, the cops weren't harassing black people. They're harassing all of us. Mm. And so there was this uh, uh, cultural thing about the talk. And all of these affluent white liberals and, afflu uh, you know, we call them awfuls, affluent white female liberals are saying, like, it's so sad that, like, these poor black people have to get the talk from their parents. And it was a commercial where it's like a guy putting his hands on the wheel, putting his keys in the dash, turning the radio down. And I'm like, what you, like that, that, that was we all got the talk. I In my neighborhood, mm. white people, everyone's parents gave them the talk. Mm. Here's what you do when the police come around. Mm. Here's how you act around cops. Don't talk to cops. When you get pulled over, you turn the car off, you put your keys, you turn the li dome light on, you put your hands on the wheel, you know, uh, don't, you know, what is it like, uh, what is it like 10, 10 and three or whatever, mm -hmm. and you roll the window down, then when the cop walks up, you look over and you ask the officer, you know, what, what the issue what is. is the problem? Then all of a sudden I see in the corporate press and among prominent liberals, this is only a phenomenon of black people, which is fundamentally false. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a phenomenon of anybody who lives in cities who came from a poor area who had to deal with police. Then the narrative becomes black people have to deal with this more than anyone else. And I'm like, you know, now you're creating racial animosity mm. because if the real factor here is when it comes to affirmative action, when it comes to income, when it comes to education is not race, but it's in fact upward mobility. And, and, and like, look, Oprah Winfrey's family is going to have no problem getting to Harvard. Will Smith's family is going to have no problem getting to Harvard. Yet the yokels out in Appalachia ain't any, going anywhere near Har Harvard. Now Harvard's outright saying they're going to give a net benefit to the children of these affluent, ultra wealthy celebrities and the poor people of Appalachia have no access based on race. All that does is create racial tension, hatred and animosity. And it does create racial tension. And it's like you said, right, because we can look at test scores, right? Who has the highest SAT scores, who has the highest scores. It's not it, I mean, you could look at how the race kind of is is separated, but you top scores are from families that are 200,000 plus a year, yep. right? And they that's- They can buy private just, tutors. Yeah, private tutors, right? And a thousand percent, that's why I volunteer every Friday, right? Because a thousand percent, not to be like pompous, right? But only a specific type of person can afford my services. And we need to make sure to disseminate that service to a, a, a broader group of people, right? But with that said, I just, I, uh, it's very, very tricky because I think you bring up the point that is by far the most valid but overlooked point in affirmative action, which is, money matters a lot, right? People historically, not even just in America, but the poor population has always been mistreated throughout history, always. It's just a fact, right? Yep. And affirmative action should take that into consideration. But hear me out, hear me out, right? What if I said I was in favor of the Harvard affirmative action way that they're kind of getting around it by making an essay? And the reason I'm in favor of it, right, and this is off the cusp, but I'm not 100% saying I have this opinion yet, right? But I formulate my opinions over time. It's not like an immediate thing, right? But I'm saying, oh, I'm trying this opinion out. I'm in favor of the Harvard affirmative action essay because it takes, it takes into consideration somebody's individual struggle with race. Will Smith's kids, Will Smith, shout out to you. You're great. You signed something for me once. Um, but <laughs> Oprah, they won't, they won't have that. Right? But they won't have that. Yeah. They will not have, if it's an individual essay, they're, or they may, or they might, they might, right? They may, and I'm not sure, I shouldn't make assumptions about people's family. They may have not had some racial issue that I was not aware of, right? But they may not have it to the extent that some of my friends had it growing up in Oakland, right? And, and I had an issue with that, right? I had an issue, and, and I do have an issue with that. So to me, Harvard policy, it's like, okay, we're gonna do a race-based essay, and you're gonna talk about what the kind of racial issues that you've grown up with. I would love to write that essay. I would opt to write that essay and have that considered for my Dartmouth application. Shout out to Dartmouth. Let's go big green. Um, but I would want that because I know my racial background did affect my upbringing, but in a way that was very different than my black friends. I, I, 
I can somewhat agree. Right. Uh, only a little bit, maybe like 10%. I'll take 10. 10, 10 10's pretty good. Uh, the issue is Will Smith's kids are still going to be able to write an essay about something they perceive. They will be able to write or, an essay that somebody else cannot bear. But but so I don't think Harvard should take into consideration that if you're the child of uh, someone worth half a billion dollars and you once had a cop pull you over it, they're like, oh, wow, you know, we got it. We got to take this into consideration because mm -hmm. it's a racial component. I think the answer is fairly simple. And it actually does play into some of the ideas of Marx. Uh, class-based oppression. Mm -hmm. If the idea is typically that the black community is less likely to have wealth, therefore, and that's the argument made by the left. They say, it's not an issue of race, it's an issue of poverty. Crime is not because of the black community, it's because of poverty. And you see that across the board. And then it gets misattributed to, the fact, to, to their race. I agree with that. So then, based on my experience, if you have an, an area that is typically, it is overwhelmingly minority population, mm -hmm. but does have white people who are poor living there as well, you then go to that neighborhood and say, we're going to give either uh, reparations or use affirmative action to lift you out of poverty based on race. What ends up happening is you get this neighborhood of mixed race group, lower income, predominantly say black, but with maybe a small percentage of white people who live there. And now you've just elevated all of the black population based only on their race and completely ignored the poor people living around them, well, which yeah, results in racism, so gang violence. Now you have people saying these people, tip, like they're going to say these people. And so if you went and said by class, we will give you admission. There's no there's no real argument for that. There's no legal argument for it. Harvard can spend the money as they want to spend mm -hmm. and they can require tuition as they want to require tuition. Mm -hmm. Then you'll end up with a neighborhood of a mixed race background. But predominantly, if, if the idea among the left is that black people are typically uh, are more likely to be impoverished mm -hmm. because of historical racism, if you did it by class, you would be arguing to disproportionately benefit these black communities mm -hmm. while not leaving behind any poor people of any other racial background. Totally fair. So we shouldn't be having race be the predicate for for. The I 100% see well, your point. Yeah. Uh, and, and I was going to say, I mean, with regards to all of this, I mean, again, we I think one of the issues that I see massively in education, not just in California, is that there is this Marxian influence. And not just, um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, Antonio Gramsci was mentioned in this uh, one ethnic studies, studies curriculum. And so was um, there was a little reference to Karl Marx, um, in addition to a variety of others, um, Paulo Freire, and who is a Brazilian Marxist. And I think the, the concerns I have is that I am seeing a growing number of some teachers who are indeed working towards political goals, politicizing kids um, into a political ideology. Um, I think, you know, just from the stories I've heard from parents, um, my, my, my son or my daughter, my children are um, experiencing, you know, all these political discussions in class. And so, you know, even in California right now, we have the state seal of civic engagement program. It is this whole push to to really get kids active and civically engaged. But there is a component of activism into this. And then at the same time, we have parents that don't know how to go to school board meetings or feel like their their speech is being chilled um, by by different things going on. And so what I see, it just seems like, you know, the, the kids kids are being taught almost in some schools, some um, to be activists, whereas on the back burner, we have the the actual academic achievement, merit, um, a quality education, a well-rounded education has changed. You know, in California, they just passed, passed um, the new math framework, equitable math um, kind of content. And so what we're seeing is even the core subjects are transforming. Right now, um, the next generation science standards are shifting a little bit. Um, I, I heard one report from Southern California where I was told that that science was was shifting and some of the high school science topics were being diminished. And in its place, the students were being encouraged to um, a debate in class, in science class, where, whereas their actual academic rigor was diminished down to almost a middle school level, but activism was heightened in order for students to argue um, how to solve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So these are just some things that I think, you know, again, and you talked about money, there's a lot of money in education. There's a lot of big organizations funding different things, and their say is really making a big influence, I think, from from what I've seen. So, um, you know, I think I think kids are missing out.
They really need, they, they deserve a quality education. They deserve to, to be able to graduate high school learning to read. They should know how to read. We're out of time. <laughs> So okay. if you got, if you want to give any final well, thoughts. Well, I was going to say, I think you, you bring up like a really good point, right? But in the end, it's like that idea of like, well, even if your kid is the smartest in the world, they, who cares if they're not active and who cares if they're a bad person, right? But I, w- I would just go to that idea of like, I think that there is a fundamental part of education that needs to be addressed. And I do think that actual academic ability is very frequently not prioritized. And just like you said, for us to take part in activism for us to push our children to activism right we need to make sure they have the fundamental skills first to make sure that they can think critically for themselves because if we push them into activism too soon we're just going to push them into the activism that we think is important and that's not my job as an educator educator i want my students to go into activism i want my i want my students to go into activism they think is important and i want their skills to kind of benefit that and i do think that in the long run that is going to benefit kind of us in general and speaking to that affirmative action idea i 100 percent see kind of that idea and it's so funny i think it's like a perfect segue it's like it's the same issue in education right that idea of like oh gosh you're just bringing up a certain group of people while leaving another behind and that's an issue right and it's so funny to have that cross comparison the only thing i would say is that inherently there's always going to be a benefit from having diversity in the classroom and in the workplace and that's a personal opinion that i don't currently have the statistics to back up and you could disagree with that no i don't think you even believe that i okay so uh, hear me out hear me out this is a good question right i will say fundamentally I do think that a diverse workspace does create a m- environment for productivity that is may not be the pro- productivity of like the greatest output, but hear me out. That, you don't hear, believe this. You don't think so? No. Nope. You don't think so? No. Nope. Okay, so- Would and, you hire a, an overt clan member in clan robes to come into your office? You know what I, so you know what I'm speaking for? You know what I'm speaking for? Actually, 100%. Your diversity. N- yeah. No, 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 not even my diversity, right? But like, hear me out. Oh gosh, right? And I have to say this. I have to say this. Oh, and don't be mad at me because this is me doing affirmative action. I make sure I have at least two to three students. I have at least a client list of like 30 to 40, right? I make sure I have at least three or four students that are Trump families. Like a thousand percent I make sure of it because it'd be weird. Well, but, but what I'm like, talking about, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not No, but I'm just saying I, like I, diversity that's, that's, to me, having a diverse client list, having diverse friends is important. How many but, How many clan members? No, unfortunately not. But this is my point. I wouldn't, I know what I, you I, mean. I, would, I wouldn't want one of these people. Right. I, I wouldn't have one of these people. Right. Like, uh, uh, I would certainly have a conversation like with them. Like you mean but like holistic diversity? That, that, I a thousand percent understand So your when point. people say diversity, they don't actually mean it. Yeah. What they mean is- oh, Okay, like the diversity that you find beneficial, like selective diversity. So it's it, right. d- diversity basically just means the people I think are worth having around. Okay, I got so you. So when everyone says we believe in diversity, like they called Black Panther diverse. Yeah. I'm like the cast was 90% black. What are you got talking you. about? I got you. I got you. And so you hear all these people talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Right. Yeah, but it's a good point on the Trump right. thing. They'll right. fire Trump support in two seconds. Right. They, they they talk about diversity and then they say, you know, they end up hiring disproportionate people of, of uh, different backgrounds I and races. I what you're saying. So you're right, actually. In nobody, the way nobody, that... nobody wants a truly diverse, like, no, I certainly don't, you don't. No, you- We don't well, want Nazis and, around. No, that was like a, well, a, and, a total gotcha moment, right? Because it's using diversity in its actual dictionary definition, you are correct, right? It's I, personal perspective. I want a personal think, perspective. Just like you said in your other podcast where that idea of like, well, where do you intervene? Well, it's a it's a moral idea, right? Do you intervene on circumcising kids or do you intervene on circum- circumcising females? You want to intervene where yeah, you it's, think it's you're, moral framework it's a moral people. framework so right. i think promoting a moral framework of diversity is important however everyone's moral framework is going to be different and that's kind of up for individual well, final thoughts final yeah. thoughts God, we well, keep going i mean uh, with regards to mm-hmm. dei which in our area is called jedi justice equity diversity and inclusion um not only oh, am i <laughs> not am i only uh noticing okay. the educational aspect but then there's environmental social governance scores and uh, corporate equality index, I feel like there is this pressure, not I feel, I see it. There is a there is a pressure for collective conformity of one mode of thought, um, which is the acceptable mode of thought. And those who are not of that, this shift from I to we are going to be on the outskirts. I mean, we see right. that on social media too. So at any rate, I think um, it's important that we have that individual individuality because that's freedom. Right on. We're we're way over, but uh, thank you both for <laughs> for hanging out. I so appreciate you. talking to everyone. Is there anything you wanted to mention? Any shout out before we wrap up? Social media or something? I don't know. Desmond Fambrini on all handles, and see people with different perspectives can talk to each other without yelling. <laughs> There's a little bit of yelling, but it was mostly like it was mostly fun yelling. <laughs> right? Yeah. <nobody laughs> nice. I, I'm mainly on Twitter, Kelly S K E. 
Thank you, everybody, for, you. for hanging out for this episode of the Culture War Podcast. Next week's going to be a lot of fun. Everyone already knows. It's, um, I believe next week is Laura Loomer and Bill Mitchell. We're going to be talking about Trump versus DeSantis, which is uh, it's getting a bit difficult considering the, the current uh, state of the polls and all that. But I hope you check it out. And uh, you can support the show by becoming a member at TimCast.com. Thanks for hanging out. We will see you all tonight at YouTube.com slash TimCast IRL 8 p.m.